Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. There comes a point in the life of most React developers when they start to wonder if there's anything else out there besides the front end. And what they usually find is that there's a whole world of databases and servers just waiting for them, and that's how a full stack developer is born. What we're gonna be doing here is taking a look at the basics of full stack development using the MERN stack. Now the MERN stack is the most common setup for full stack development with React, and the technologies that it uses are right in the acronym. We have MongoDB, which is the database that's generally used. We have Express, which is the server framework for creating REST APIs. We have Node.js, which is the runtime on the server side, and Last of all, we have React, which of course is the front end. So these four technologies fit together really well because they all rely primarily on JavaScript, which means you can write an entire full stack application using a single language. Now the project we're gonna be building here to get our hands dirty is just sort of a full stack to-do list application that will allow users to keep track of their to-dos. This kind of application needs no introduction, I'm sure. You've all worked on it before. So the point here is not so much to go into depth on what each of these technologies is and you know how it works, but the point here is for you to walk away with a good understanding of how all those four technologies fit together to create a full stack application. So with that being said, let's get started building that application. All right, so before we get started building our full stack application here, I wanna talk about the main pieces of a full stack application, since this will kind of help you get a better idea of how everything we're about to do fits together and what the responsibilities of each piece are. So as you may or may not already know, a full stack application generally consists of two main pieces. On one side here, we have the front end. This is usually the code that runs in the user's browser. So I'll write front end there. And we have the back end over here, which consists of essentially the rest of the code, right? All of the code that's not running in the user's browser, that's running on servers, uh, consists of the database, etc. So the front end, as I've said, is the code that runs in the user's browser. So this is generally the React code, right? In a full stack React application, this is all of the front end React code that we write. Everything that has to do with, you know, displaying data to the user, uh, re-rendering things in the browser, working with DOM elements, etc., is on the front end. The back end, on the other hand, is a little bit more involved. It usually consists of a web server, which I'm gonna draw as this box here. And it also usually consists of a database, which is usually drawn like this. This is generally the symbol you'll see for, for that. And if you want to think about these two pieces in this way, the web server is kind of like the secretary, if you will, of the back end. It's what handles all of the requests coming in from all of our users uh, on the front end, okay? So... This is usually what actually handles those requests and you know takes care of loading data from the database, et cetera. Okay, so the database, on the other hand, is considered to be kind of the hippocampus of the back end, if you will. It's the place where all of our applications' persistent data is stored. Okay, so those are the basic pieces of the front and back end. In the case of a full stack React application or a full stack MERN application, the technologies we're gonna be using here are going to be React on the front end. Okay, so that is the R here. And for the web server, we're gonna be using a framework called Express, which is the E in MERN. So we'll say Express. For the database, we're gonna be using MongoDB, which is the M. MongoDB, there we go. And Node.js is the runtime that our web server runs inside of. So Node.js, if you're not familiar with it already, essentially what it does is it allows us to run JavaScript code outside the browser. It's a server-side runtime for JavaScript. So this is where Node.js comes in right here. And as you might have expected, that is the N. 
in MERN. So together, these four technologies make up the MERN stack, as we've seen. And one of the really nice things about the MERN stack is that all of these technologies use JavaScript. So React uses JavaScript. Express, written in JavaScript, since it's in Node.js, right? Which is, as I said, a JavaScript runtime for the server side. And MongoDB is a non-relational database that is very good at storing JavaScript objects, right? We don't need to convert them into rows and columns in order to store them in MongoDB. So essentially, this MERN stack, the reason that you've probably heard a lot about it in the past is because it allows developers to know a single language, and that is JavaScript. Okay, see, it used to be that you had to know several different languages just to get a full stack application working, right? You'd have to know something like PHP to write a server. You'd have to know SQL, right? Some kind of dialect of SQL in order to work with the database. And then, of course, you'd also have to know JavaScript for the front end. So this is very useful for JavaScript developers. And as you're going to see while we build out our app, really all you need to know to get started with this is JavaScript. So anyway, that's the basic setup of a full stack MERN application. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we're familiar with how the basic pieces of a MERN stack application fit together, let's talk about the application that we're going to be building. So we're going to be building a full stack to-do list application. It's going to have several pieces. It's going to, of course, have a form up at the top that will allow users to create new to-dos, right? So they'll be able to type it in here and click on this button here and create new to-dos. Underneath that, it's going to have a list of all the to-dos that the user has created. And each of these is just gonna have like the name, maybe it'll have the date, etc., that it was created at. And it's also gonna say whether it was completed or not, okay? Additionally, each of these is going to have some buttons on it, one that allows the user to delete the to-do and one that allows the user to mark the to-do as completed. And of course, there will potentially be a lot of these to-dos underneath it. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward application, and it's an example that we've used in other contexts. But I've found that it's a really great example for getting an idea of how a full-stack React application works. Okay, so just to talk in a little bit more detail about how all this stuff is going to fit together, all of the data for our to-dos is not actually going to be stored on the front end. It's going to be stored on the back end. So what this means is that our front end, our React application, is going to have to communicate via network requests to our web server, right? which will also be managing our database down here. Okay, and it's going to have to make requests depending on what it wants to happen. So if it wants to load the data, it's going to have to send a request to that, and the server will send back that data. Okay. If it wants to create a new to-do item, it's going to have to send a request for that. And the server is going to have to send back some kind of corresponding data once it's created that new to-do. And likewise for deleting to-dos and marking them as completed. Now, we'll see how all of this works inside a React application very shortly. But first, let's create the front end of our application. Now, to do this, we're going to be using Create React App, which is just the boilerplate generator that allows us to create all of the boilerplate code for our React projects. And the command we were going to run for that is going to be npx create react app, and then the name of our application. So I'm going to call this application to do's front end. And I'm also going to add the use npm flag because I want to use npm as the package manager instead of the default yarn. That's just a personal preference of mine. If you prefer yarn, leave that off. Okay, so let's run this and that will generate our React app for us. And just another thing that I wanted to point out as well is that you'll want to make sure you have some up-to-date versions of Node.js. 
Well, and first of all, you're going to want to make sure you have Node.js installed in general. The way you can check that, first of all, you wouldn't have been able to run the command that I just showed you if you didn't have it installed at all. But the way you check your Node and NPM versions is by typing Node-V and NPM-V. And your versions should be somewhere around the ones that I have, right? If you have something like Node 8 or Node 6 or Node 4, something fairly old, you'll probably run into some problems with some of the basic commands we'll be running here. So if you don't have these versions, I highly recommend you install an up-to-date version of those. Google is going to be your friend for finding that. And if your versions are higher than mine, well, that's great, right? Everything should work just like we want it to. So getting back to our front end, and we can see that the Create React App script has finished running. What we're going to do now that we've created that project is just change directories into it. So we're going to say cd to do's front end or whatever you called your directory. And we're going to open this up in Visual Studio Code by typing code dot, right? That only works for Visual Studio Code if you have it set up in your terminal. Otherwise, just do file open. And now that we have this open, let's just run it to make sure everything works by typing npm run start. That's how you run applications generated with Create React App. And that will open up our application in a browser at localhost 3000. So everything looks good. This is just the basic code included by the Create React App boilerplate generator. So let's go back here now and get started building out the front end for our application. So the front end is going to consist of three main components, and we're just going to create those directly inside our source directory here. So we're going to say new file and create those components. The first component is going to be the to-do list itself. Okay, that's going to be basically the component that surrounds and takes care of displaying each individual to-do item. Okay, so it'll be this border component here. The next one we're going to create is going to be the to-do list item component. This is going to be the individual items that we're going to be displaying inside the to-do list. I found it's usually nice to have a separate component for items inside a list. And the last component we're going to create is the new to-do form component. This is going to be the form up at the top of our component that will allow the user to create new to-dos. Okay, so now that we have these three components, uh, what I want to do is just go into our app.js and delete everything that's inside of there. So we're going to just delete everything inside this return statement, and we'll just put a placeholder there to make React happy and say hello. <laughs> or you know what, let's say my to-do, since that'll be the title of our application. Okay, and we can also delete this logo thing. You can delete logo.svg, since that was just the spinning atom thing. Uh, that we saw when we ran our application. And that is the basic setup for the front end of our application. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've set up our front end but before we go about creating each of these components that we've added here, what I want to do first is set up the back end for our application. And in order to do that, well, first of all, there's two main ways you can go about this. One is to simply have the back end code directly in the same directory as the front end. And the other main way is to have the front end and back end in separate directories. Now, as you might have guessed by the fact that I named this to do's front end, what we're going to be doing here is the second one, and we're going to be creating an entirely new directory for our back end. This isn't necessary, but I do find that it helps keep things more organized when you don't have your code all in the same repository. So in order to generate the project for our backend, there's really no need to use a boilerplate generator like we did with our React project, because generally Node and Express projects tend to be a lot simpler. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. But first, let's open up a new terminal. And in fact, I'm just going to go back to the one that I used to create our front end application. And I'm going to change directories back into where I keep my React projects. So that's just React for me. Uh, you're just going to want to change directories into wherever you want your node project to be, your backend that is. 
And what we're going to do is we're just going to create a new directory using the make directory command. Now this is going to be different for you if you're on Windows, I believe, right? Just look up how to create a new directory Windows command line. And the same goes for any of these commands that I run uh, if you're using Windows or some other kind of operating system besides a Mac. So the directory I'm going to create, we'll call to do's back end and hit enter. And then we're just going to change directories into that directory we just created and open that up in a separate IDE window. And there we go. So to set up a node project, which will also include, by the way, uh, Express, since Express is just the framework that we'll use to create our server. You'll see what that looks like shortly. Uh, the first thing we have to do is initialize this directory as an npm package. And the way we do that is by running the command npm init dash y and hitting enter. And what that'll do is generate this package.json file which will basically just contain some information about our project, such as scripts we can run, uh, what dependencies our project has, the versioning of our project, etc. Our front end has the same kind of thing to keep track of its dependencies as well. Uh, and if you want to see a more complicated one, take a look at that. So the next thing that we're going to do now that we've generated this package.json file is we're going to install some of the packages we're going to be using uh, on our backend to write our server. Now there's really two main packages we're going to be installing here. The first one is Express and the second one is MongoDB. This is basically the package that will allow us to interact with a Mongo database via JavaScript. So we're going to install both of those by hitting enter. And you're going to see that node modules will appear, which is basically just all of the dependency code. That's kind of interesting stuff to look through if you're ever bored. And we also see that this package lock.json file has been generated. This basically just contains the exact versioning for all of our dependencies dependencies. And it's quite a lot bigger, as you can see, than our regular package.json file. All right, so now that we've installed Express and MongoDB into our backend directory, the next thing we're going to do is set up our server. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to start off by creating a new folder called source. And inside here, we're going to create a new file called server.js. And I just want to point out that the names that I've used here, right, source and server.js, these don't have to be the names and this also doesn't have to be the directory structure of your backend, right? There's not really any kind of hard and fast rule behind how you should organize a backend project. So you could name this main.js, you could name it index.js, you could have the source folder just not even exist and have this JS file in the root directory. You know, whatever you want to do, but this is the way I usually prefer to do things because it kind of follows the same structure as on the front end. Okay, so inside this server code, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by creating a basic Express server. So I mentioned that Express is what's called a server framework uh, for Node.js. And all that means is that it just makes the process of creating a server that will respond to requests, that kind of thing, a lot easier than if we were to just write it using bare Node.js code. So that's why a lot of people use it. The way that we're going to set up a server, we're going to start off by importing it from its package. So we'll say const express equals require express. And this might be a different syntax than you're used to for importing packages. Okay, on the front end, for example, whenever we wanted to import something, we would just say import blank from blank, right? So we would say something like import use state from React if we wanted to use the use state hook, okay? And the reason for that is that by default, Node.js wants us to use this import syntax, right? Instead of using the actual import keyword. Now I'll show you very shortly how we can actually fix that. But for now, we'll just write our imports using the require keyword. Okay, and now that we've imported Express, we're going to create a new server by saying const app equals Express, and we're going to call Express as a function, right? That's just how we create a new Express server. 
And the last thing we need to do is we need to tell Express that we want it to listen for requests on a given port by saying app.listen. And the first argument we pass here is going to be the port number we want it to listen on. Usually, just by convention, we use 8080 or 8000 for this port. Um, some of that will depend on what port your front end is running on, right? You can't have them running on the same uh, port, obviously. So we're just going to use 8080 here. And the second argument here is a callback function that will be called once our server has successfully started. So usually what I like to do here is just say console.log and, you know, maybe say something like uh, server is listening on port 8080. Okay, and that is how you set up a basic express server. So you can run this now by saying node and then the path to this file. So node source slash server.js and hitting enter. And you should see that it logs out server is listening on port 8080. Now this server doesn't really do very much right now because we haven't added any endpoints. And, and what we're gonna have to do is add endpoints for each of the different actions that we want our front end to be able to take, right? So we're going to need to have an endpoint for creating to-dos. Okay, so creating to-dos. We're going to have to have an endpoint for uh, marking to-dos as completed, right? So we'll just call that updating. We're going to have to have one for deleting to-dos. And of course, we're going to have to have one for loading to-dos, which is usually referred to as reading. And as you can see, I've organized this so that the CRUD acronym is clearly visible. This is basically what that means in the context of web servers. Um, so we're going to have to create endpoints for each of these, which is something that we'll get to a little later on. Before we do that, I just want to set up one rudimentary route that we'll be able to use just to make sure our server is actually responding to our requests. Now, the way we add a route to an express server is by saying app.get. And then the first argument we pass here is the path that we want this endpoint to be listening on. So I'll just say something like test. And the second argument here is a callback function that will get called whenever our server receives a request on this endpoint that we've specified here, right? This path. Now, the way that this callback works is it takes two arguments, which we'll talk about in more detail a little bit later, and those are request and response. Now the request argument is just an object that contains basic data about the request that was received, right? So in other words, it contains information such as who the request came from, any additional data that was included with the request, etc. We'll see how to use that later on, as I said. And the second argument here is a response object, which we can use to actually send a response back to the client. So how this is going to work is for this test route, we're just going to send back a very basic hello world response to the client by saying res.send. And we'll say something like hello from the back end. Okay, and that is how you write a very basic endpoint in Express. What we're going to do now is kill our server by pressing Control C and restarting it in order to make those changes take effect. And what you should be able to do now is if you open up your browser and go to localhost 8080 slash test and hit enter, you should see that message that says hello from the back end printed out to the console. And that's how we set up a very basic backend for our application. We'll obviously be seeing how to add a lot more functionality to this as we build out our app. But for the meantime, it's good just to know that we have this working. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've set up a very basic backend for our full stack application, we're gonna head back to our front end here and start implementing these components and seeing how to make them interact with the backend. So first of all, let's just implement some of these components. We're gonna implement our to-do list item, to-do list and new to-do form. And here's what those are gonna look like. So for our to-do list item, what we're gonna do is say export const to-do list item 
equals. And this component is gonna take three main props. One is going to be a to-do prop. The second one is going to be an on-click complete prop. So this is going to be a function that's called whenever the user clicks the mark is completed button on one of the to-do list items. And the last item is going to be on click delete, which will be a function prop that will be called when the user clicks delete on one of our to-do list items. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is inside here, it's gonna be a pretty simple component. It's not gonna contain much logic besides the JSX. What we're gonna do is say div. Inside there, we're going to have an H3 heading that will be the actual text of the to-do item. So before we get to that, let's just talk very briefly about what these to-do items are gonna look like. Basically, the to-dos, which we're going to eventually be loading from the server, are just gonna be JSON objects that contain a few key properties. So the first property is going to be a text property which will be the actual text of the to-do, right? I don't know, uh, sleep, for example. And they're also going to contain an is completed property, which will be a Boolean, just uh, you know, specifying whether or not that to-do has been completed. So it'll either be true or false, essentially. And that's pretty much all we're gonna need for now. So getting back to our JSX, the way that we're going to display the text of the to-do is just by inserting the to-do's text into our JSX here. So we'll say to-do.text. Under that, we're going to check if the to-do is completed and basically use that to display, uh, you know, a complete message if it is completed. The way we're gonna do that is by saying to-do.isCompleted and, right, this is how we make sure that the thing comes after it is only displayed if the thing that comes before the double ampersand is true. All right, so if the to-do is completed, we're just gonna display a paragraph tag that says complete. Okay, and underneath that, we're going to display our buttons. Now our buttons are gonna look like this. We're just gonna have two of them. One is going to be our mark is complete button. And when this is clicked, it's going to call the on click complete prop that we specified up there. So we'll say on click complete. And the button will say mark as completed. And underneath here, we'll have our delete button, which will say on click equals on click delete. And this one will just say delete. Okay, so that's what our to-do list items are going to look like. Uh, let's move up to our to-do list now. Here's what this component's gonna look like. We're gonna start off by importing the to-do list item, since we'll obviously be wanting to display that inside this component. And then we'll create our component by saying export const to-do list equals, and this component is gonna take three props as well. They're going to correspond to the three props that we saw in our to-do list item. So the first one is going to be to-dos. Now this is going to be the array of all the to-dos we want to display inside the list. Whereas, you know, the to-do prop inside our to-do list item was just an individual to-do. We're also gonna have an on complete to-do and an on delete to-do prop. And these are going to be the functions that correspond to the on click complete and on click delete functions that we're passing into our to-do list item. You'll see how that fits together in just a minute if you can't already guess. And inside this component now, what we're gonna do is say return. We're going to wrap all of our to-dos inside a div. And inside here, we're going to basically map each of our to-do objects to a to-do list item component. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say to-dos.map and for each to-do, what we're gonna do is return a to-do list item with the to-do passed into the to-do prop. And for on click complete, we're gonna pass in on complete to-do. And for on click delete, we're gonna pass in on delete to-do. Okay, so pretty straightforward. That's really all we need to do inside our to-do list. One thing that we are missing, however, 
is a way of identifying which to do was marked as complete or which to do was deleted, right? Inside our to-do list item, we're just kind of blindly calling these functions whenever the corresponding button is clicked. And in to-do list, we're not really helping the matter any. So the way that we're gonna do this, right? I mentioned that each of our to-dos was going to have uh, a text property and an is completed property. And additionally, we're also gonna add an ID property, which is just gonna be a unique identifier that we can use to refer to each of our to-dos, right? This makes things like referring to a specific item in a list a lot easier if we have that ID property. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to assume for now that each of our to-dos has that ID property. And you'll see how this all fits together once we actually start working with the server. But assuming that each to-do has an ID, what we're gonna do is change the onClick method of both our delete and mark as completed buttons to onClickDelete to-do.id and onClickComplete to-do.id, okay? So that'll help us refer to each of our to-dos in our to-do list. And the last thing we have to do is we have to set a key when we use todos.map, right? That's just something that React wants us to do whenever we display lists. It helps with re-rendering. So for that, we're gonna use the todos ID as well. So we'll say todo.id for the key. All right, and that is our to-do list. So the last component we're gonna implement here is our new to-do form. This one's gonna be pretty straightforward as well. We're gonna say export const new to-do form. And since this one is going to have a form element in it, right, a text input, we are gonna want to import the use state hook from React. And down here, we're going to give this a prop called on click create, right? That'll basically allow our app component or whatever the new to do forms parent component is to know when the user has clicked on that create button after entering something. So, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off by creating our state variable, which will keep track of the state inside our text input. So we'll say const input value and set input value equals use state. And the initial value of that's going to be an empty string. And then underneath this, we're gonna define the DOM structure of our new to do form. And that's gonna look like this. We're just gonna say div, and we're going to have an input here, which will be of type equals text. The value is going to be input value. And for on change, what we're gonna do is say event and we're gonna call set input value whenever it changes with e.target.value. That just keeps the value of our input in sync with the value of this state variable as the user types. We might also wanna put a placeholder in here. So we'll say something like placeholder equals, uh, I don't know, enter a new to do, something like that. And that's our input. So additionally, we're also gonna to wanna to have a button that the user can click to create a new to-do with that input text that they just typed in. So what this is gonna look like, we're gonna say button, and for the onClick method, what that's gonna look like, we're gonna call onClickCreate with the input value. So whatever parent component is passing this prop in to new to-do form, it'll be able to know when the button was clicked and what the text was for the new to-do. Okay, so we're gonna call that now with the input value. And we're also gonna set the input value back to an empty string, okay? That's just kind of a basic user interface thing. Okay, so this button now is going to say create, and that's our new to-do form. So we now have all three components implemented for our to-do list application. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created the basic components for our front end, let's actually display those inside our app component and talk about how our front end is going to approach communicating with the back end. So first of all, let's import the components we created. We're gonna import our new to-do form. 
and we're going to import our to-do list. All right, we don't need to import the to-do list item because that is automatically displayed by the to-do list. All right, so the way that this is gonna work, and I'm just adjusting my indentation there. The way that this is gonna work is we're gonna basically display our to-do list app all inside its own div here. Under that, we're going to say new to-do form. And for the on click create prop, we're gonna pass in our own function, which I'll get to in just a minute. For now, we'll just leave that blank. And underneath our new to-do form, we're going to display our to-do list with its to-dos prop, which I'll get to in a second again. And for on complete to-do, we're gonna pass in our own function. And for on delete to-do, we're also going to pass in our own function. So all of the parts that I've left blank here are basically where communicating with the server comes into play, right? Obviously when we call on click create from our new to-do form, we're gonna wanna make a request to the server telling it, hey, we wanna create a new to-do with this text, right? And with our to-dos prop and our to-do list, that's where we're gonna to want to load the to-dos right when our application starts, okay? And likewise with on complete to-do, we're gonna to want to update our to-dos and on delete to-do, we're gonna to want to send a request to the server telling it we wanna delete a given to-do. So the way that this is gonna work I'm just gonna discuss the create, complete, and delete ones for the time being. We're just gonna have a separate function for each of those that makes a corresponding request to the server. So we'll have a function for creating a to-do. We'll say create to-do, and that's going to take the to-do's text as an argument. And inside here, right, this is where we're gonna make our actual network request. So we'll just, uh, Leave that blank for now. Underneath that, we're going to have our function for marking a to-do as completed. For that, we'll say const complete to-do equals, and we're gonna take the to-do's ID as an argument. And inside here, oops, I said const twice, let's delete that. Inside this function now is where we're going to make a request to the server telling it we wanna mark a given to-do as completed. And under that, we're going to have our delete to do function, which will also take a to do ID as an argument. And as you may have guessed, we're gonna make a request to the server telling it we want to delete a given to do. Okay, so that's gonna be our basic strategy with doing those kind of operations with our to do's. And we'll see what the actual requests look like shortly. But loading to do's is gonna be a little bit different. Essentially what we're gonna do for that is import the use state hook and store all of the current to-dos for our application in a state in our app component. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say const to-dos and set to-dos equals use state and the initial value of our to-dos is just going to be an empty array. Okay, so okay, so basically nothing will be displayed in our application until we actually load our to-dos. So we'll pass those to-dos to our to-do list right now, even though they're just blank. Essentially, the strategy we have to take when we're loading to-dos is we wanna load our to-dos right when our app component is first rendered. Now, as you may remember, the way that we do this in React is by using the use effect hook. Okay, so essentially when we're loading data inside one of our components, it's gonna generally take the same form, which is this one. We're gonna say use effect. And we want this effect only to be called when the app component is first rendered. So we pass an empty array as the second argument here. And inside this use effect, what we're gonna do is define an asynchronous function that will actually load the data for us. So we'll say something like const load to do's equals async. And then we'll actually call that function here. And the reason we do it this way, and the reason we can't just put async right there on use effect is because use effect doesn't allow asynchronous callbacks. So unfortunately we just have to define it inside this use effect callback like we're doing here. Okay, and inside this load to do's function is where we're going to actually make that request to the server that will load our to do's for us. Okay, so let's just pass the other functions here to their corresponding props. So for on click create, we'll say create to do. For on complete to do, we'll say 
complete to do. And for on delete to do, we'll say delete to do. All right, and before I show you how to make requests from the front end, let's actually go to the back end and create those basic endpoints that will allow us to do things like create, delete, etc. for our to dos. So first of all, before we add MongoDB, which in itself is a pretty involved process, in order to allow ourselves to at least build out the server and get an idea of how it's going to work, what I usually like to do is create just a basic in-memory database, right? Which is just a, an in-memory array that will get erased when the server is restarted. And for now, let's just create a fake to-dos array. So we'll say const fake to-dos equals, and inside here, we'll create our to-dos. Uh, that we'll just use for development purposes for the time being. So we're going to say ID one, two, three, the text uh, for this one, we'll just say go to the grocery store and for is completed, we'll say false and we'll just make one more fake to do that ID will be two, three, four. The text for that one will be uh, something like learn full stack development. And that one's sort of partially completed. So we'll say is completed, uh, I don't know, just, just so that we can see the difference between completed to do's, we'll mark that one as true, okay? So now that we have those fake to do's, we can actually build out our basic endpoints for our application. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about how each of these endpoints works or you know the syntax behind it. So first of all, let's delete this app.get test endpoint. And we're gonna create four endpoints for the four different operations that our application is going to need to perform. So the first one is going to be for loading our to-dos. So for that one, we'll say app.get. And the path for this one is going to be slash to-dos. That's just sort of a restful convention for REST APIs. And for the callback, we're gonna say request response. And all we're gonna do for this one is send back our fake to-dos to the client. And the way we're gonna do that is by saying response.send fake to-dos, okay? And in situations where we're sending back a JSON object as we are here, what uh, what's usually recommended to do is to say res.json instead of res.send, although both of them will work in this case. All right, so that is our read endpoint, right? The endpoint that will allow our application to load to-dos. So let's restart our server by killing it with control C and then running node server, rephrase, and then running node source slash server.js. And we should see that it says server is listening on port 8080. All right, so first of all, you can test this by going to localhost 8080 slash to-dos and hitting enter. And what you'll see is that we get back the JSON data corresponding to the fake to-dos that we're sending back to the client. Okay, so essentially all we need to do on our front end is have our front end be the one that makes this request instead of our browser as we're doing here. Now, the way that that works is on our front end, we're going to first of all install a package called Axios. Now, Axios is just a very helpful package that makes network requests in React very easy to perform. So we're gonna hit enter and that will install that package for us. And the way we're gonna use that to load data from our backend is by saying import Axios from Axios. And down here in our load to do's function, we're gonna say const response equals await, because it is asynchronous, all server requests are going to be asynchronous because they take a long time in computer terms. And we're gonna say axios.get, and we basically have to specify the endpoint we wanna send this request to. So there's a few ways we can do this. One way is by actually specifying the full localhost 8080 slash to do's, Okay, and I'll show you what happens when we do that in just a minute. But anyway, once we've made that request, we have our response, and we're gonna wanna update our to-dos state to the to-dos that the backend sent back to us. So how that's gonna work, all of that data is just going to be in response.data, 
Okay, that's just how Axios works there. So what we're gonna do is say set to do's response dot data. All right. Now this won't actually work yet for one main reason, and you can see that reason if you run your application uh, with npm run start. Okay, if you open up your terminal now in your running to-dos application, you're gonna see something that's very common when you're first getting started with full stack development, and that is something called a cores policy, okay? So essentially what this means is that our website doesn't like the fact that it's sort of straddling between two different origins, right? We have our localhost 8080 and localhost 3000. Now in production, we'll usually have our front end and back end served from the same port. So that won't be a problem. But in development, the way that we get around this is either by adding something to the server or my preferred way of doing this is to go into package.json inside our front end and adding a proxy property to it with the URL of our backend. So HTTP localhost 8080 slash. And what this actually allows us to do is inside our front end now, whenever we wanna make a request to the server, we don't have to specify this initial part here. We can just say axios.get slash to do's. And that will also get rid of the cores error that we saw uh, for reasons that I won't go into right now. And in order for this to work, we do have to restart our front end. I always get confused when I run into the errors that I get from that. So we'll restart our front end and that should make it work, right? So we see that we have now loaded data from our back end and we're displaying it inside our front end. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that our front end is loading data successfully from our back end, really the only thing we have left to do is implement the other operations that we want our front end to perform. Okay, so we already have our create to do, complete to do, delete to do, those functions set up. So we're just gonna need to go into our back end and create those corresponding endpoints and make sure that they manipulate the data accordingly. And then we can just do essentially the same kind of function call inside each of these functions. So let's head over to our backend and we're gonna add three more endpoints here. So the first one is gonna be for creating to-dos. Now we've been using app.get when we just want to load data from a given endpoint. But the fact is that that's just one of a lot of different options for different request types that we can accept on the backend. So what I mean by that is generally when we do things like create data, we're gonna to want to use post requests. And the reason we do that is because post requests contain what's called a request body or a request payload, which allows the front end to include extra data along with its request. So what I mean by that, you'll see what I mean by that. We're gonna create this endpoint as app.post. And for the path here, we'll have slash to do's just like we had for app.get. Again, this is just a restful convention here. And these two won't interfere with each other because they're different kinds of requests. So you can have a get request endpoint and a post request endpoint with the same path. And for the callback here, what we're gonna be doing is basically having our front end send the text of the new to-do. Okay, so the new text or whatever we end up calling it. It's going to include this inside its request when it sends it to our server, okay? so. Basically what our server is going to do is it's going to access the value of new text and use that to insert another item into our fake to do's array up here. Okay. So here's what that's going to look like. The way that we access extra data on our request object is simply by saying const, and then we'll say something like new to do text equals request dot body. All right, so request.body basically contains all of the extra information that the client side has sent along with its post request. And in order for this to work, I swear you will spend a lot of time pulling your hair out trying to figure out what the problem is if you miss this. I know I certainly have. In order to get this request.body thing to work, you actually have to go up here under where we create our app and say app.use express 
Python.json. Basically, what this tells Express to do is when it sees a post request with a JSON request payload, it will actually take that, parse it, and add it to request.body here down in our uh, down in our callbacks. If you forget to do that, all that you'll see is that request.body will be undefined. And uh, if you just Google that right now, you'll see that there are a lot of people who have asked that very same question. So anyway, that is the new to-do text. What we need to do next is just create a new item that we'll insert into our fake to-dos array up here. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna say const new to-do. The text for that to-do is going to be the new to-do text is completed is going to be set to false at the beginning. And for the ID, we're gonna need to generate that randomly. And the way that we do that is usually by using a package called UUID. Okay, so basically this just generates random unique IDs that have a very, very low possibility of colliding. So we're gonna hit enter and that will install that package for us. And the way that we're gonna use that is by saying const UUID equals require UUID. And then to generate an ID down here, what we're gonna do is we're going to say ID UUID dot V4 and just call that as a function which will generate a new ID for us. It's a little bit weird looking like that, uh, but, but that will generate a random ID for our new to-do. Okay, so now that we have our new to-do, we're just going to push it onto this array here. And let's just change this to let since we're gonna to want to modify it. Not that JavaScript cares if it's const or let when it comes to modifying arrays and objects, but that's another story for later on. So the way that we're gonna do that is by saying fake to do's dot push and push our new to do onto that array. Now, as far as the response that we're gonna send back to the client here, usually what's considered to be a pretty good practice from create endpoints is to actually return the to-do that you just created, right? This will allow the client side to get the ID that we assigned on the server. So what we're gonna do is say response.json and send back the new to-do to the client side. Okay, so if we restart our server now, in order to make those changes take effect, we're gonna say node source slash server.js. If we go back to our front end now and implement this create to-do function, Here's what it's gonna look like. We're gonna say const response equals await axios dot post, right? Because remember, we wanna make a post request here so that we can include extra data. And that post request is going to be to slash to do's and the extra data that we include as the request body is going to be new to do text, to do text, right? That's that argument that we're getting uh, inside this function here. And once we have the response, right, which remember is going to contain the new to do we just created, what that's gonna look like is we're gonna say const new to do equals response dot data. And we're going to set our to do's to all of our existing to do's with that new to do added onto the end. So the way we can do that is by saying to do's dot concat new to do. All right. And one thing that I just realized when I was typing this out here is that we need to actually get our new to do text from request.body dot new to do text. Okay, so this body here is essentially whatever object we pass as the second argument when we make the request from the client side. All right, so let's restart our server again just to make that change take effect. And it should be running. And let's run our front end as well. Oh, here, we need to actually make these asynchronous because they are using the await keyword inside of it. So just so I don't forget, I'll add it to all of them. Okay, and let's give this a try now. We're gonna go back to our front end in the browser. We're gonna enter a new to-do item. So we'll say something like, um, you know, add a post endpoint, click on create. And sure enough, we see that the add a post endpoint shows up and it's persisted if we refresh our front end, which means that we're getting that successfully loaded from the back end. And that's how we create new resources in a full stack way. One last thing I wanna point out here is that while we're just pushing a new to-do onto an in-memory array inside our back end right now, 
This will eventually be the job of the database. So this will be replaced with the corresponding MongoDB method when we get there, right? We're just doing this right now because it's a lot easier for the time being. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the last things that we have to do in this full stack application, besides obviously adding a database, which we'll get to later, the last things that we have to allow our front end to do is mark our to-dos as completed and delete to-dos. So let's start off by adding endpoints for those things to our back end. What we're gonna do is say app.delete, all right? So we'll start off with the delete endpoint. And essentially the way that this one is gonna work is the path is going to be slash to-dos slash, and then we're gonna use a URL parameter, which will be the ID of the to-do that we wanna delete. So in other words, if we wanna delete to-do one, two, three, right? We'll send a delete request to to-dos slash one, two, three, okay? That's essentially how that'll work. Uh, it's just, a, again, a RESTful convention when you're writing REST APIs. So first of all, let's talk about how we get this ID in Express. All right, the way that we get URL parameters in Express is simply by saying const to do ID equals request.params.todo ID. And there's nothing special that we have to do here, like uh, you know, like how we had to add app.use express.json for our post requests, right? Up here. There's nothing special that we have to do in this case. We can just say request.params.todo ID. So now that we have the ID, we're going to remove that from our fake to-dos. And the way that we're gonna do that is by saying fake to-dos equals fake to-dos dot filter. And we're gonna filter out the to-do with that ID. So we'll say to-do, to-do dot ID does not equal to-do ID. Okay, so that'll basically give us all of the to-dos whose ID does not match the ID in this URL parameter here, which should remove the to-do that we want to. Okay, so now that we have that, there's two main things that we can do uh, in responding to the client side. One thing would be to send back the updated array of all of the to-dos, right? This would be very useful because it would allow the front end to basically just set the to-dos state to the response that we get back here. The other thing that we could do is basically just respond with nothing and duplicate this logic on the front end. So what I'm gonna do is just send back the updated to-dos because that's easier. And for that, we're gonna say response.json fake to-dos. And that will allow our front end to basically just say set to-dos to whatever it got back in this response. Okay, so that is our delete endpoint. The last endpoint we're gonna create is one for updating our to-dos. Now for this one, we're gonna use a put request, which just like post requests can contain a request body with extra data. And for this one, we're gonna use the same URL, right? The same path that we used for our delete endpoint. So we're gonna say slash to-dos slash to-do ID. And inside here, what we're gonna do is we're basically just gonna mark the to-do with that ID as completed, okay? So all we have to do is say const to-do ID equals request.params.todo ID. And under that, what we're gonna do is say fake to-dos dot find. We're gonna find the to-do with that ID like this, to-do.id is equal to to-do ID. And we're going to set its is completed property to true, all right? So that's all we need to do for that one. And just like with delete, we're gonna send back the updated to-dos just because that avoids having to duplicate that logic on the front end. So for this, we'll say response.json fake to-dos. Okay, so those are our delete and update endpoints. Let's go back to our front end now and actually make those requests. So what this is gonna look like for complete to-do we're just going to send a request to the backend by saying const response equals await axios.put. And we're gonna use backticks here and say slash to do's slash and insert the to do ID that we're getting from the argument here. All right.
And we don't actually need any request body in this case, even though that would be a possibility if we needed to. All right, so now that we've got our response, we're just gonna call set to do's with response.data. And that will set our to do's state to the updated to do's. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing with delete to do. All we need to change is we need to change this to axios.delete and set to do's response.data is the same thing as before. So we should have a fully functioning app at this point, which we can check. First of all, we're gonna to want to restart our server to make those changes take effect. I almost forgot that. And we're gonna go back here, refresh just to make sure we have the most up-to-date version. Oh, and one thing you'll notice too, this is why we'll want to use a database in the future, is when we refresh the database after creating a to-do or something like that, we'll see that the data is reset to the way it was initially. Okay, so our data isn't persisted when we restart our server, in other words. We'll see how to add a database later on. Okay, so let's just test marking as completed and deleting. Marking as completed, we should be able to do by just clicking on mark as completed. And it looks like we got an error for that. So let's go back here and take a look. Ah, here, I just forgot to add request and response to the callback here. Not sure why I forgot that, but let's add that right now. And we're gonna have to restart our server to make that take effect. So node source slash server.js. And we should be able to go back now, refresh our application and mark is completed. And we see that that marks a given to do as completed. And we can also delete our to-dos by clicking delete. And we see that disappear. And just to test that we can still create, right? That we didn't mess anything up there. We can say something like build a full stack app, create. And we can now mark that as completed because we have done just that. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. In the basic MERN stack application that we saw how to build earlier, you'll notice that we never actually added the M, which is MongoDB, to our application. We were just storing all of our data in memory. So what we're going to do here is see how to actually incorporate MongoDB into a full stack application so that we can persist our data. Because currently, whenever the server restarts, all of the data is lost, which obviously isn't ideal. And that's why we're going to add a database. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so to get started with adding MongoDB to our backend, first of all, you'll probably want to check and make sure that you don't already have it installed locally, which you can do by typing MongoD dash dash version. Okay, and if you see something like this, right, 5.0.1 or 5.0.2 or 5 point something, then you're good and you don't need to install it. But if you get something like MongoD command not found, then what you're gonna need to do is Google MongoDB community download. You are gonna have to Google that specifically because it's actually very hard to find on MongoDB's website. They've unfortunately replaced a lot of uh, this with their more paid models. Um, but anyway, you're gonna want to download MongoDB community server and you know, you'll probably want to use 5.0.2 or 5.0.1 or whatever version you have because I'm using, as you saw, 5.0.1. Okay, so you just need to select that version, select whatever platform you're planning on installing it onto, right? That would be Windows if you're working on a Windows computer, or Linux, some kind of Linux if you're working on a Linux machine. And you're gonna just want to download that and walk through the installation process. It's pretty straightforward, okay? So anyway, once you have MongoDB installed and set up, you're gonna want to make sure you have it running in the background. And the way that you can check that is by typing Mongo and hitting enter. And if it opens a shell like this, this is the Mongo shell, then everything is installed and Mongo's running correctly. If you get something like unable to connect, 
you'll need to just Google how to get MongoDB up and running on your machine. It's going to be different depending on what kind of operating system you have, etc. Okay, so now that we have MongoDB installed and set up, the first thing that we're going to do is take this fake in-memory database that we had in our server file and insert it into an actual Mongo database locally. So here's what this is going to look like. The first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to connect to the Mongo shell by typing Mongo and hitting enter. Okay, and as I said, this is the MongoDB shell. Basically, what we can do in here is run MongoDB commands, which allow us to, you know, manage our databases, uh, create data, delete data, update data, etc. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to want to do is create a new database for our application here. And the way that you can do that is simply by typing the command use and whatever you want the database name to be. Okay, so if we want to have this be something like full stack react to do's, right, something like that, then what you can do is hit enter and you should see switched to FSR dash to do's. And basically that means that any commands we run now in the shell will be affecting that database. And if you ever want to switch databases, right? If you had, let's say a development database and a production database, or uh, for some reason you just had to manage more than one database, all you have to do to switch between them is use that same use command. Anyway, once we have that database created, what we're going to do is insert our fake to do's array into that database. And the way that we do that is by saying db dot, and then we can type the collection name. So in our case, we'll want this to be to do's. And collections, by the way, are sort of the NoSQL equivalent to uh, tables, right? So we'll say collections are roughly equal to tables, very, very roughly, right? Because they're really are very few differences between them besides the fact that collections and tables both contain similar data so to speak okay they're both meant to represent a resource is what i'm trying to say here okay so now that we have db.todos the way that we insert documents into mongodb one way is just by saying insert one and then specifying the document that you want to insert right so if we wanted to insert our first to do here we could say ID one, two, three text, go to the grocery store and is completed false, right? It's all just basic JavaScript syntax when you're inserting data like this. Okay. And we could hit enter now. And what we'll see is it says acknowledged true and inserted ID, object ID, blah, 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 blah. Now, what this means, right, this acknowledge true thing, that just means that everything went well and that that document was successfully inserted. This inserted ID is the randomly generated ID that MongoDB will automatically assign to any data that we insert into the database. Now, this does kind of make the ID property that we have on our fake to-dos a little bit obsolete. So what we can do is simply remove those and use MongoDB's ID property instead. Now the difference between MongoDB's ID property and our own ID property is that MongoDB simply puts an underscore before it like underscore ID. Okay. So now that we've inserted a piece of data into our to do's collection in our FSR to do's database, so the way that we can actually see all of the documents, right? And documents is the NoSQL equivalent of records in an SQL database. The way that we can see all of the documents in a given collection is by saying DB and then the collection name, and then we can say find. And the argument that we pass to find is an object that contains the criteria we want to use for filtering. Now, if we want to get all of our to-dos as we do here, we just pass an empty object and hit enter. And we'll see that the one to do that we've inserted is printed out to the console like this, right? So we can see that we have all of the properties that we've inserted. And additionally, we have this underscore ID property that MongoDB has inserted for us. Now, when you print out a lot of data, right? It, obviously it can get a little bit messy reading it in the console. So 
So what you can do is you can actually add at the end of this dot pretty, and that will basically take your JSON and format it nicely to make it a lot easier to read, right? This, this is great when you have to scroll through data and you're looking for something to not have to try and read it all unformatted. So that's how we find basic documents inside MongoDB using the MongoDB shell. Let's insert our other to do, right? And to do that, we're gonna use the same command as before. We're gonna say db.todos.insert1. And we'll just leave the ID off of this one because we're gonna start using MongoDB's built-in ID property instead. What we're gonna do is say text, learn full stack development, and is completed true. Okay, and we're gonna hit enter. We're gonna see the same acknowledged true and inserted ID things printed out. So the next thing that we're gonna do, well, here, if you wanna see all of our to-dos in the database now, you can just say db.todos.find.pretty, and you'll see all of the to-dos that our database contains so far. Okay, so that is how we create and read items in our Mongo databases. Updating items in our Mongo databases is pretty straightforward as well. It's a little trickier than just inserting items, but uh, you know, it's nothing that you can't handle, I'm sure. So to demonstrate this one, let's say that we want to change the text of one of our to-dos, okay? The way that we would do that, we would say db.todos.update, okay? And the first argument that we pass to update is that same filter uh, that we passed to find, okay? So that'll basically filter out all of the items inside our to-dos collection and only apply those updates to those items. So if we wanted to apply a given update to all of our items, right? If we wanted to, um, you know, add an extra property to all of our items, what we would do is we would just say update with an empty object is the first argument. And for the second argument, this is where something called a MongoDB query object comes in. And it's just a basic JavaScript object, but it contains some special properties that will basically tell MongoDB how we wanna update our uh, documents. So the most common one to see in this one is dollar sign set, okay? Basically what this does is the value we pass to it will contain the keys and the new values that we want to set on the corresponding documents that match this filter. So if we wanted to set all of our to-dos is completed properties to false, the way that we could do that is we would say dollar sign set, the object we pass to that would then be is completed false, okay? And that's what that would look like. Basically, this is telling MongoDB for everything that matches this criteria here, set is completed to false, okay? And we're gonna see a slightly different thing printed out here. This is a write result, which just contains basic information about what the result of that operation was, okay? And if we find our to-dos again, which we can do by saying db.todos.find.pretty, what we'll see, well, actually, it looks like nothing was changed, and there is a very good reason for that. And that reason is that the update method doesn't like it when we pass an empty filter, which honestly I forgot about until now. In order to update all of your items in your database, what you're gonna need to do instead is use the update many method. Okay, so if we hit enter now, what we'll see is that it says acknowledge true, matched count two, and modified count one. So in other words, there were two things that matched the filter we passed, that is this empty object here, and only one of those was modified because one of them already had is completed equal to false, okay? So if we find our to-dos again with that same command, we're gonna see that is completed is false on all of them. Okay, so that's how to update items in MongoDB. If we wanted to just update a single item, what we would do is we would say db.todos.update and for this filter, we usually end up passing in the ID. So, so let's say that we wanted to modify this learn full stack development one. I'm gonna copy that object ID thing there. And what we're gonna do is set the text to something different. We're gonna say something like set text, learn full stack 
React development. And we'll hit enter there. And we'll see n modified one. Okay. So now if we find our to do's again, we'll see that that property has been updated inside this to do. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to look at here is how to remove to do's. And the way that we do that in MongoDB is using the remove method. So what we're going to do is say db.todos.remove. And if you want to remove all of the items in a collection, which I normally wouldn't recommend, is you can just pass an empty filter like that there, right? And if you hit enter now, you'll see that it says n removed two, right? In other words, we removed two documents. And if you try and find our to-dos again, you'll see that nothing gets printed out. And I wanted to use this as a way to show you how to insert more than one document at a time. So the way that we can do that is by saying db dot to do's dot insert many. Okay. And basically what we do is we just pass an array of data that we want to insert. So let's just copy and paste our fake to do's here for now. We're going to paste that inside of here and close off the square bracket and the parenthesis. And we're going to hit enter. And we should see that it says acknowledged true and inserted IDs is now an array of IDs that were added to those objects that we inserted. Okay, so our database is all set up now for our app. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we have an actual Mongo database set up for our backend. And what this means is that we can now convert over our endpoints to use that database instead of this fake in-memory array thing that we've been using, which, as we've seen, gets reset whenever our server restarts. Okay, so we're going to convert over our endpoints, but before we do that, I want to show you a few things. The first thing I want to show you is how to make our server automatically restart whenever we make changes to one of our server files. Okay, uh, you may have gotten tired already of typing out node source slash server .js and hitting enter every time you want to actually see a change occur that you've made to the file. The way that we normally have our server restart automatically is by using a tool called node daemon. Now node daemon is a package that we can install by saying npm install node daemon and it is spelled no daemon i know some people pronounce this differently like no daemon no daemon right node mon some people pronounce it like it doesn't really matter the point is that this is something we can use to automatically restart our server for us when we make changes now this is something that we'll only want to be using in development, so to avoid bloating our production code, we're going to add the save dev flag on the end of this and hit enter. And now that we have that package installed, the way that we can run our server and have it automatically restart when we make changes is by running the command npx node daemon and then the path to our file so source slash server.js and hit enter and what you'll see it'll tell you that node daemon is starting up right and then you'll see server is listening on port 8080 now the difference is since we're using node daemon if we make some kind of change to our file like you know if we delete something and save it you'll see that it says restarting due to changes and it tells you starting node source server.js and then we see server is listening on port 8080 again. So essentially, all Node Daemon is is just a tool that sits and watches, waits for file changes, and whenever that changes, it will automatically rerun our app for us. Okay, so I like using this tool a lot. Most Node developers do because it just saves a lot of time and having to kill the server and restart it. So one other thing that I'm going to suggest that you do is instead of just typing out this command every time to run your code, I'm going to suggest that you add a special script for it inside your backend's package.json file. So the way that this works is all you have to do is inside this scripts portion of your package.json, you're going to add another property. And the name of this property is basically whatever string you want to use to identify this command. 
So for running Node Daemon, I usually use the script name of dev. Okay, I'll show you how to use that in just a minute. And for the value, all we have to do is tell npm what this string is a shortcut for. Okay, so if we want to have that be a shortcut for our node daemon command, the way we can do that is we just say npx node daemon source slash server.js. And now what we can do is instead of having to type that out every time, we can just say npm run dev, and that will automatically run this command for us without us having to type it all out. Now, this isn't that long of a command, but in general, dev scripts and other kinds of scripts that you might want to run in your terminal can get pretty long. So, you know, being able to add scripts like this is very useful. All right, so now that we have Node Daemon restarting our server automatically, the other thing I want to show you how to do here is I want to show you how to be able to import things the normal way inside Node.js, right? Uh, I pointed out earlier that in our front-end files, we're able to use import Axios from Axios, and when we export something, we're able to say either export default, or we can export named exports like we did in our components here by saying export const new to-do form. Now, the way that we make this possible inside a Node.js program, and just to show you beforehand what will happen if we try and uh, do it without any changes. If we were to say import express from express, which is the equivalent of this const express equals require express thing, and import UUID from UUID, what we're going to get if we try and run our server, right, if we say npm run dev, we're going to see it says cannot use import statement outside a module. Now, there are various ways to fix this, but my preferred way is using a tool called Babel. That is B-A-B-E-L. I prefer using this tool called Babel to basically do what's called transpile my code from one version of JavaScript to an older version of JavaScript that Node supports. Okay, so just to, just to give you a brief idea of what's going to happen here, right? The code that we wrote here using require syntax this is what Node needs to run currently. And there are other ways to make Node accept this more modern import syntax, but essentially when you create a new Node project, it's going to want you to use require like this. So what Babel does then is it allows us to write our code, right? It allows us to write our JS files using this more modern import export syntax. And then it will actually transpile Transpile just means that it converts the code from one syntax to another. It transpiles that to an older version of JavaScript that uses require. And this does take care of things besides import and export as well. So when we're working with MongoDB, for instance, we're going to want to use async and await syntax, right, in order to interface with the database since those are somewhat lengthy transactions that take place. So we're going to want to use async and await, and that's something that Node also does not currently support by default. So Babel will also take care if we write async await in our actual source code, it'll actually transpile that into basic promises that Node.js knows how to work with. And if you're not familiar with any of these terms, don't worry about it too much. Just know that we need Babel in order to be able to write the most modern JavaScript syntax possible and still have it work in the Node.js runtime. So anyway, this is what we'll be writing, right? This side, the most modern JavaScript syntax here, and this is what Node.js will actually be running. Okay, so in that way, Babel basically keeps both sides happy. So in order to use Babel, we're first gonna have to install a few packages into our project. The first package we're gonna install is going to be called Babel slash core. The second one is going to be called babel slash node. And the third one is going to be called babel slash preset dash env. Okay, so let's hit enter. And, oops, actually, before we do that, <laughs> let's say save dev because these are development tools that we're going to be using here. You generally won't want babel in production. So let's hit enter and that will install those dependencies as development dependencies.
And once that's finished, we can actually go and start using Babel. And the way that we do that, first of all, we have to add a new file into the root of our directory. And that file is going to be called .babelrc. And what this file is, it's basically where we tell Babel what presets we want it to use to transpile our code from one form to another. Now, fortunately for us, the specific features of Babel that we want are pretty standard. So the only preset we need is the preset env that we installed earlier. Okay. And the way that we specify this file is it's just a JSON object with a single property called presets. And this is an array. And into that array, we're going to insert our Babel slash preset env thing that we installed earlier. Okay, so now that we have this Babel RC file, we should be good to run our application with this import syntax. And the way that we do that, it's a slightly more complicated command. We have to say npx babel dash node. This is the Babel node package that we installed earlier. And then the path to our file. So we're gonna say source slash server.js. We're gonna hit enter. And we should see that it says server is listening on port 8080, which means that our import syntax is now working and we can delete these things here. Okay, so the last thing we need to do when we use this npx babel node source server.js thing, we're back to the same problem as before, where in order to make any changes occur, right, if we were to change this back, in order to make that change actually take effect, we have to restart it and rerun that command. Okay, so in other words, we're back to square one before we had node daemon. So in order to make node daemon and babel node work together, all we have to do is change the command slightly. So here's what the command is going to look like. I'm going to type it out here and then we'll change our script inside package.json. So we're going to say npx node daemon, and then we're going to use the dash dash exec flag. This basically allows us to pick a specific command that node daemon will uh, execute instead of it just using the node command by default. And that command is going to be npx babel dash node source slash server.js. Okay, so what we're doing is we're telling node daemon to watch our files and when some kind of change occurs, run this command here. Okay, so we're gonna rerun it. We're gonna see that it's running our command that we specified and that it says server is listening on port 8080. Okay, now that is a long command, so I generally recommend putting it inside your package.json file. So we're gonna replace this script in dev with npx node daemon blah, 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 blah. And one thing you can actually do, because inside scripts, the npx is kind of implicit, we don't have to add npx, so we can just remove that from there and shorten it a little bit to node daemon exec babel node source server.js. Okay, so let's restart it now and run it using that script. So we can just say npm run dev now, hit enter, and we see that our server is automatically running using babel node and node daemon. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've improved our development flow a little bit using Node Daemon and Babel Node, the next thing that we're going to do is learn how to connect to MongoDB from inside our server. Okay, so the way that we're going to do this, and first of all, you're going to want to make sure that you have the MongoDB driver installed, which you can do by running npm install MongoDB. So we'll hit enter, and that will install that package. And the next thing that we're going to do is inside that server file, we're going to import something called Mongo client from that package. So that's going to look like this. We're going to say import Mongo client from MongoDB. And basically what this Mongo client thing is, is an object that we can use to create a connection to our local Mongo database from inside our JavaScript code. Okay, so this is kind of similar to what we did in the terminal when we just typed Mongo and opened up a shell, except now the one that's actually going to be running the commands is our Node.js and Express code here. So that's what Mongo client does essentially. It's the way that we create a connection to our Mongo database locally.
is pretty straightforward. We say const client equals await mongo client dot connect. Okay, and then as an argument here, we pass the URL of the database that we want to connect to. Okay, so just like our front end could make requests to our back end using a specific URL, our back end is going to connect to the database using a specific URL. Now the URL we're going to want here is going to be mongodb colon slash slash and then localhost, right? So MongoDB runs on localhost as well when we're on a local machine. And the port number by default that MongoDB is gonna run on is 27017. Don't ask me why they chose that number. I'm sure there is a reason, but I've never looked it up. And the last thing we need is we're gonna put the name of the database we wanna to connect to as the final segment to this. So that's going to be FSR to dos. And in addition to the URL, we have to pass a configuration object to Mongo client. And there's really just two main things that we need to pass here. Both of them just have to do with MongoDB compatibility. So don't worry too much about these because they do have slightly confusing names. The first one is called use new URL parser, and we need to set that to true. And the second one is use unified topology and we're gonna set that to true as well. Again, all this is is for compatibility reasons with older versions of MongoDB, so don't worry too much about these. Anyway, that is how we connect to a local Mongo database. If you were gonna to connect to another database, like uh, let's say you were hosting a Mongo database on the cloud, all you would have to do is change this URL to something else, and you might have to include some kind of username and password in that as well. Uh, but for now, you know, our Mongo database is just local, so we can access it using this URL here. All right, so since we're using await with mongoclient.connect because it is an asynchronous function, what we need to do is basically put this inside its own function, which will be asynchronous. Now, again, if you're not familiar with async and await, uh, don't worry too much about it. Just know that uh, whenever you use await, it has to be inside an async function. And we're just going to create a function called start that we're essentially going to put all of our server code inside of. So what this is going to look like, we're going to say const start equals async. Okay, and inside there, we're going to put all of our server code so far. And what that will do is it will allow us to use this client thing inside all of our routes. So we're gonna be using client inside our routes to basically connect to the database and perform whatever kind of changes we need. All right, and then down at the bottom, we need to actually call that start function like this, and that should basically start everything up. So last thing, before we actually get started uh, switching over our routes to use MongoDB, is we're gonna delete this fake to-dos array since we won't need it anymore, okay? Now, one last thing, let's try and run this just to make sure everything is good. We're gonna say npm run dev, hit enter, and we should see server is listening on port 8080. Although if you try and send a request now to any of the endpoints, you'll get an error because uh, the fake to-dos is no longer in existence, right? We just deleted it. So, so that's how you create a basic connection to MongoDB. And the last thing we need to do here is get a reference to the actual database. Okay, so this is similar to how we typed use FSR to do's inside the Mongo terminal. To do that, we just have to say const db equals client.db, and then we pass the db name by saying FSR to do's like that. And that's all we need to do to connect to our database inside the server and start making requests to it. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we're officially connected to MongoDB inside our server, the next thing that we're gonna do is take a look at how to convert over our endpoints. So the first endpoint we're gonna do this with is our load endpoint, our read endpoint, whatever you wanna call it. Basically the one that our client loads all of the to-dos from. Now, since we've already inserted the to-dos into the database, 
all we need to do inside this endpoint is use this DB that we've connected to, to basically make a correct DB query to MongoDB. All right, so here's what this is gonna look like. We're gonna start off by removing this response.json thing, right? Since fake to do's no longer exists anyway. And in its place, what we're gonna do is say const to do's equals await. And we're gonna use this DB thing now to basically make the same kind of queries that we saw how to make inside the Mongo shell. Now these are gonna look a little bit different than the queries that we made inside the Mongo shell, but that's just because of how the Mongo driver in Node.js actually works. So just keep that in mind. Now, the way that we do this, we're gonna say db.collection, and we have to specify the collection name here, which is going to be todos. Okay, so that's the part that's different from the shell. We would have just said db.todos inside the shell. And after that, we're gonna say find and as the criteria here, we're gonna pass an empty object like that, okay? So essentially that will give us all of the documents inside this to-dos collection. So now that we have our to-dos, all we need to do is send those back to the client by saying response.json to-dos and save that. And it looks like we have a Babel parse error. And the, oh, the reason for that is we used a wait inside this callback function without making the callback function asynchronous. Okay, so we're gonna need to do that to all of these. So I guess I'll just go through and do that in each of these uh, right now. So we'll say async, async, and async. And let's test this now. Okay, so we should see that our server is listening on port 8080. Let's go back to our front end and we're gonna need to probably run that as well. So we'll say npm run start, hit enter. And uh-oh, it looks like we got an error saying todos.map is not a function. So what that means essentially is that the todos that we're sending back from the server are not actually an array. Okay, now I will admit that I forgot about this, but this is a great thing to uh, troubleshoot. Let's try logging out the to-dos that we're sending back here to see what it is we're actually sending back. Or better yet, we can actually go into our browser, go to the network tab, and take a look at what data we're getting back in the response. So this is a very important troubleshooting skill when you're doing full stack development. Uh, basically, when we go into the network tab, we can find the exact place where we loaded the to-dos. Here it is right here. And we're gonna click on that and take a look at the response. And what we see is that for some reason we're getting back this events and events count thing, which is not at all what we want. So there is a reason behind this and I'll just tell you what it is. Basically when we use this find function in MongoDB, in order to actually convert it into an array that contains all of the data that we inserted, we just have to say dot to array and save that. It took me a while to figure that out the first time I started working with MongoDB. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't just getting the to-dos back. So anyway, we should be able to go back to our front end now and refresh this and see that our to-dos are successfully displayed. And these are being loaded from the database and sent back to our client, right? These are not a uh, fake in-memory database anymore. As we can see, by the fact that if we restart our server, okay, and we'll just restart it uh, on purpose, we're gonna see that those to-dos are still persisted. Now, creating to-dos won't work right now, and also marking to-dos as completed and deleting them won't work either, and those are things we're gonna take a look at shortly. But for the meantime, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we're loading our to-dos from the Mongo database, the next endpoint that we're gonna switch over is the one for creating new to-dos. So this one's gonna be pretty straightforward as well. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by getting the new to-do text, just like we did before. And we're also gonna create our new to-do, except we won't need this unique ID generator thing anymore. Right, because what we're gonna do, as you'll see, is we're gonna switch over our app to use Mongo's default 
underscore ID property instead. So we can just remove UUID. We can also remove that as an import. And if you want to, you can even uninstall that package by saying npm uninstall UUID. Okay, and that will uninstall that package for us. So the next thing that we're gonna do now that we have our new to-do is insert this new to-do into the database to-dos collection. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna say db.collection to-dos dot insert one, and we're going to insert the new to-do into there, okay? So we're gonna wanna say const result equals await db.collection to-dos insert one. And what this result contains, if you'll recall, is it contains the new ID that was added to this new to-do here. So what we can do now that we've inserted this new to-do into the database, well, there's really two things we can do. One thing is we could actually get that new to-do that we just created. And to do that, we could say const to-do equals await db.collection to-dos dot find one and we could use the ID inside this result here. So we would have to say underscore ID result dot inserted ID. Okay, and we could use that to basically load that new to do with its new ID because that's the problem here. We don't have the new ID that we wanna send back to the user. But what I'm gonna recommend you do instead, right, to avoid having to make unnecessary database operations, what I'm gonna suggest you do instead is just use that ID property, right, that inserted ID, and basically send that back to the client along with the new to-do data. So here's what that'll look like. We're gonna say new to-do, and we're gonna use the spread operator to get all of the current attributes from it. And under that, we're going to add in the inserted ID property by saying result.insertedID. Okay, and that will send back our new to-do with its randomly generated ID that MongoDB gave to it back to the client. So let's give this one a try now. And we're gonna need to run our server again. So we'll say npm run dev because we stopped it to uninstall the UUID package. And now that it's listening, let's go back to our front end and try and create a new to-do. Oh, but before we do that, we need to actually convert our front end code over to use the underscore ID property. So let's head back here and we're just going to search for dot ID in our code here and change that over to to do underscore ID. Okay, so we'll change that here and change that there. And our front end is now using that underscore ID property instead of the old ID property that we were generating ourselves. Okay, so it should work now if we take a look at it in the browser. Let's just make sure we have the most up-to-date version by refreshing it. And we'll try and create a new to-do. All right, so let's, uh, for a to-do, we'll say convert endpoints to MongoDB. And we'll click on create. And sure enough, we see that it says convert endpoints to MongoDB. And if we refresh this now, we'll see that that's persisted. And even if we refresh the entire server, right? If we kill it and restart it. NPM run dev. We're gonna see if we refresh our app now that it still has the same data which is really one of the main purposes of a database. So that's how to convert over the create endpoint to use MongoDB. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've converted over our create endpoint. The next endpoint we're gonna convert over to use MongoDB is going to be the delete endpoint. So this one's gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, all we're gonna have to do is call the remove function on our collection with the appropriate ID and MongoDB will take care of the rest. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna leave 
to do ID, which we're getting from the URL parameters. That's uh, just like we want it. And we're gonna remove this fake to do's thing because again, fake to do's no longer exist. And in its place, we're going to put our MongoDB query. So essentially what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say await db.collection to do's dot remove one. And it is important that we say remove one in this case, just in case something goes wrong with our filter, right? Uh, it could happen that if you say something like ID and to do ID and to do ID ends up being undefined or something like that, it could happen if you were to use something other than remove one that it would delete your entire collection by accident. So obviously we want to avoid that. Uh, and that's why we're using remove one here. So all this is telling MongoDB is that we want to remove the to-do with the ID property equal to this. But in order for this to actually work, we need to import something else from MongoDB up at the top. And that thing is called object ID. So essentially, remember that when we were playing around with MongoDB in the shell, which I can show you again. So we'll say Mongo, hit enter. If we say use full stack react to-dos, and say db.todos.find, right? Remember that the underscore ID property that MongoDB gave to us is supposed to be this object ID thing with the string inside of it, okay? Uh, a lot of people forget to actually convert this string into an object ID before using it to query by ID, and it just doesn't work, right? So we need to actually wrap this to do ID thing in an object ID, right? That object ID constructor we just imported and that should work. The other thing that we have to do, however, I will right, just run NPM run dev to start up our server again. The other thing that we have to do is remember that this delete endpoint was sending back the updated to do's to the user. And the way that we're gonna do that here is we're just going to load all of the to do's from the to do's collection after we've made this remove one query here. So the way that we're gonna do that, we're gonna say const to do's equals db dot collection to do's dot find. We're gonna find all of them and convert that to an array. And this is just like what we did up here too, by the way, there's really no difference. And now that we have those, oh, we need to say await by the way too. Uh, now that we have our to-dos, we're just going to send those back to the client by saying response.json to-dos. And that should allow us to delete our to-dos. So let's head back to our front end and give this a try. So we're gonna try and delete one of our to-dos here. We'll delete, uh, go to the grocery store, okay? So we're gonna say delete. And it looks like something happened or didn't happen rather. All right, let's take a look at our server. Aha, it looks like there was an error. And this error says remove one is not a function. Aha, and that is because uh, after talking about how we use remove one uh, in such detail, it's actually called delete one. Okay, remove is when you wanna remove more than one of them. Okay, so what we're gonna need to do is, well, just restart our server, which happens automatically, and let's give that another try. So we're gonna refresh. We're gonna try and delete, go to the grocery store. And sure enough, it works now, like a charm. So that's how we delete items from a Mongo database using Node.js. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so before we go about converting our friend tracker application over to full stack, let's talk a little bit about basic full stack conversion strategy, okay? So in other words, when we're faced with a front end application that's basically fully functional, how do we go about converting that over to be full stack? Well, I'll tell you what I do. What I usually do is go through and identify all the places in my application where I'm either loading or modifying data. Okay, so in our friend tracker application, there are, I think about 10 places where we're doing things like this currently. The first thing,
let's just talk about where we're actually loading or using data. Okay, this is something that usually takes place in our context currently. Uh, so first of all, we need to be able to load our friends. Okay, we also need to be able to load our favorites, of course. Okay, these pieces of information are used in several pages across our application. And we're also going to need to be able to load our friends by ID, right? This is going to help us out on the friend detail page. So we're going to need to be able to load individual friends. We'll just say load friend individually. Okay. And additionally, we're going to need to be able to load our users profile data. So we'll say load profile data. And that's about it. So these four things here are currently the data needs of our application. So this sort of thing is generally going to become a get endpoint of some sort. Okay, each of these is going to become its own endpoint, as you'll see. Okay, so that's loading data. And these are collectively referred to as read operations. Okay, that's the R in CRUD that you might have heard about. Next, let's talk about where we need to be able to create data. Okay, so the main place we need to create data is going to be when we create a new friend. So we'll say create new friend. And you might also consider adding a friend to your favorites, a create operation as well, since this is actually adding an ID to our favorites array. So we'll just include that under create for now. We'll say uh, create new favorite. And there is kind of a fuzzy line sometimes between these things. Uh, it kind of depends how you implement it on the back end sometimes. So these are our two main create operations that our application has currently. And when we convert our application to full stack, these are generally going to become endpoints on our server that listen for post requests, right? The post request, again, allows us to include extra information, right? Such as the information for a new friend if we're creating a new friend or the ID if we're adding a new friend to our favorites. Okay, and these are, of course, the create operations, which is the C in CRUD. Okay, and next up we have update operations. There are a few cases inside our application where we need to update some kind of existing information. The first one is when we edit our friends information. So um, we'll say something like edit friend info. Okay, so when we go to the friend detail page and we click on edit and we make some changes to their data by, you know, changing some of the values in the text inputs and then we click on save. That's when we need to update that friend. Okay, and the other time that we're going to need to do this is when we edit our own profile data. So edit profile data. Okay, and these together make up the update operations. And these are generally expressed on the server by using put request routes. So there's not really a whole lot of reason that you would use a put request instead of a post request. And I've certainly seen it done with post requests when you want to update some kind of resource, but it's just the restful convention to have put requests in this situation. So uh, these, of course, make up the update section, which is the U in CRUD. And the last thing we're going to talk about is deleting resources on our server. And I'm kind of running out of space here, but there's only two main cases where we'll need this. And those are when we want to delete a favorite. Okay, so when we want to remove someone from our favorites. And the other case, which we actually haven't implemented in our application right now, but that is going to be when we delete a friend. Okay, and if we have time, we'll be seeing how to add that as well. Okay, and these are expressed on the server, usually by making delete endpoints. Okay, so we'll be sending a delete request to those endpoints in order to activate them. And of course, that is the D in CRUD.
Okay, so these are all of the different data needs in our application at this point, right? And I've been talking about them as if we've built our server, but the fact is that all of these are currently handled simply in the favorites context and in the friends context as functions, okay? So essentially what we're gonna do is for each of these, we're going to create the corresponding endpoint and we're gonna convert over whatever component it is or whatever context it is that's actually handling that data to get its data from the server and to make requests to the server when we need to change some kind of data. And again, this strategy of mapping out all of the different data needs of your application can really help when you're converting over a front-end application to a full-stack application. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the last endpoint that we're gonna to need to convert over to use MongoDB is the update endpoint, right? The one that marks our to-dos as completed. And this one, just like the others, is gonna be pretty straightforward, so let's see what it's gonna look like. All right, so we're gonna start off by deleting our fake to-dos stuff because, again, that doesn't exist anymore. And what we're gonna replace it with is a call to MongoDB's update one function. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say await db.collection to do's dot update one. And the first argument that we pass to this is a filter that will specify or which document single we wanna update because we're using update one. And just like for our delete one function, this is going to be underscore ID object ID to do ID. Okay, so we're converting that to do ID string into an actual MongoDB object ID with this constructor. And the second argument to update one is going to be the updates we want to make to the given to do. Now, we saw this earlier when I was showing you the MongoDB console, but all we're gonna need to do is say dollar sign set and inside here, we basically tell MongoDB what properties we wanna to change to what values on the object that matches this filter, okay? So in our case, that's going to be is completed, and we're gonna to wanna to set that to true, okay? And again, just like we did up here in our delete endpoint, what we're gonna to want to do next is load our new to-dos and send those back to the client. So to do that, we'll say const, to do's equals await db dot collection to do's dot find dot to array and say response dot json to do's. Okay, so we're sending that back to the client now. Let's give this a test run inside our browser and try marking a to do is completed. So we're gonna click this and we should see that it says complete. So that's exactly what we wanted to happen. That should be all we need to do. So at this point, we have a fully functioning, full stack to-do list application that uh, stores all of its data inside Mongo database and uses a server to kind of moderate that data. And finally, it allows the user to interact with the data in our app through this React front end. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we know the basic strategy that we're gonna to use to convert our application over to full stack, let's create the server for our application, okay? So what we're gonna do for that, we're gonna use the same approach that we've used before, and we're gonna create a new directory for this. So what I'm gonna do is change directories out of our friend tracker application, and I'm just going to create a blank directory uh, called friend tracker server. You can call it friend tracker backend. You can call it something else entirely if you want, but that's what I'm going to call mine. I'm going to say friend tracker server. And this command might be different if you're on Windows. I'm not exactly sure what the Windows command for that is, but if you're confused, just look up make directory in Windows terminal, something like that. Okay, so now that we have that directory, let's actually open it up. Okay, so we're going to go into here. We're going to go into our React folder. Well, that's where I keep all my projects anyway. We're gonna open up 
friend tracker server. And let's start setting up our server, okay? So the first thing we have to do is initialize our directory here as an npm package, and we can do that by saying npm init-y, and that will generate this package.json for us, which will keep track of our dependencies, scripts, etc. So now that we've done that, let's install some other things that we're going to need. The first thing we're going to install is Express, of course. We'll be using this to create our server and all of our endpoints, so let's hit enter, and it will install that for us. And we're not going to install MongoDB yet because what I usually like to do when converting an application over to full stack is I usually like to start off by just using a fake in-memory database, right? We've seen this earlier. I just find that that helps me write my code in more of a database independent way if I start off that way. And, and it's also a lot easier when you don't have to worry about databases up front and all of those operations. So Express should really be the only package we need for the moment. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new folder called source. And this is where we're going to put our server file, which we'll call server.js. And inside here, let's set up a new Express server. But before we do that, I do want to set up Babel as well. Okay, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, what I'm doing here because we've already seen this before. Uh, what I'm going to do is just install the Babel core package, the Babel node package, and the Babel preset env package. These will take care of transpiling the code for us. Oh, and I actually want to add save dev on the end of that because those are going to be development dependencies only. And while those are installing, Let's actually create our Babel RC file, which will tell Babel how to transpile our code. Inside here, we're just going to need to put presets and have an array and say Babel slash preset. And I do go into more detail on this when I show how to set up a basic MERN stack. So if you're not familiar with this, feel free to go check that out. So that's our Babel RC file. And we've installed those Babel packages down here. So the next thing we're going to do is install the node daemon package by saying npm install node daemon save dev. That one's a dev dependency as well. And it will automatically restart our server for us as we make changes, as some of you might remember. Okay, so now that we have those installed, Let's actually add a start script to our package.json that we can use to start up our app. Uh, I'm going to call this script dev. And some of you might remember this command. We're going to say node daemon dash dash exec babel dash node and then the path to the file that we want to run continuously, which is going to be server.js. So source slash server.js. Okay. So that's our script. We'll be able to use that to run our server code once we actually write it. And because we just set up Babel, we'll be able to use import export syntax as well as async and await. So what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to say import express from express. We're going to create our server by saying const app equals express and call that as a function. And we're going to tell our server to listen by saying app.listen and we're going to tell it to listen on port 8080. And for our callback here, we're going to just log something out to the console that says server is listening on port 8080. All right, and that is all the server code that we need in order to actually have our server running. But in order to make it do actual interesting things, what we're going to do is copy over our fake data from the front end and put it inside this server.js file for the time being. So let's open up our front end. I opened the back end in that IDE window, so uh, let me just reopen that again. Okay, so we're going to open up our friend tracker here. We're going to find that data file that we had, so let's open that up. And this contains the friends data as well as the profile data. We're going to just copy this over, copy it, and we'll put it directly inside the server file. Actually, why don't we create a new file for this? That's going to get kind of cluttery, I think. So we'll create a new file inside here. We'll call it, uh, we'll call it fake database.js. All right. And inside here, of course, we'll say uh, export 
And let's change these to let so we can actually change them. All right, so we're gonna say export let, and we'll change this to profile data. And we'll say export let, and we'll change this just to friends, okay? This is going to kind of mimic our setup when we actually add a database to our server. And the last thing we need to add to this file is an array that will keep track of the favorite IDs. Okay, so basically the front end is going to be loading all of its data from our server. So let's say export let favorites, and this is just going to start off as an empty array. All right, so we have our favorites, our friends, and our profile data. Let's go back into our server now, and uh, we're just gonna import those. We'll use them later as we actually implement each of our endpoints. So we'll say import profile data, friends and favorites from fake database. And one last thing we're gonna do, because we are gonna be making post requests, we will need to actually get the payload, right? The request body from those. So we need to tell Express to expect that by saying app.use express.json. All right, that just parses the body of any incoming requests and adds it to the request argument in the callback. And that should be all the setup we need to do for our server. So let's run npm run dev and make sure everything runs smoothly. And sure enough, we see that it says server is listening on port 8080. If you really wanna test and make sure that you have everything set up correctly, you can always add a very simple endpoint here like slash test and request response. And you can just send back something like response.send hello from express. All right, and we should be able to test that now by opening up a browser and going to localhost 8080 slash test. And we should see hello from express returned from our server. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. If you're like me, then more often than not, your personal projects will start off as primarily front-end applications with little to no back-end functionality. But inevitably, at some point, you're gonna want to allow users to start storing their data and allow more people to start using your app. And that's when we need to actually convert our front-end application to a full stack application. Now, the first step in this process is generally converting our front end over to load all of its data from a server of some sort, and of course, building out the server. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. So in order to basically see how to add a server to a front end application, what we're gonna be doing here is using the friend tracker application that we built in the React course. So you're gonna to need to clone that from GitHub if you don't already have it, or just watch the course. And we're gonna see how to convert that to load all of its data from a server instead of just storing it in the user's browser. All right, so that's our basic plan of attack. Let's get going. All right, so now that we have our basic server set up, let's start implementing some of the endpoints for loading data. So we're gonna start off by implementing the read endpoints and then we'll move on to the others after this. Okay, so as I said before, there are gonna be four main loading endpoints, one for friends, one for favorites, one for getting an individual friend's information by ID, and one for the user's profile data. Okay, so let's just create those right here, right now. They're all gonna be get endpoints, and the path for them is gonna be a little different. For the friends, we're literally just gonna have it be app.get slash friends, okay? So when our front end wants to load data from here, it will send a get request to localhost 8080 slash friends, and that will send back all of the friends inside our fake database here for now, right? Eventually, it will send back the actual friends from an actual database. Okay, now the callback for this is going to be request and response. And essentially, all we're going to do for now is just send back this friends array to the client side. So that's going to be super simple. 
we're just going to say response dot, uh, we'll say dot JSON, since we're sending back an actual JSON object, it just helps to set certain headers, that kind of thing. And we're going to put friends as the argument to that. Without databases, it's really quite a simple process to, you know, build out these loading endpoints. Okay, so that's for our friends. Let's do our favorites now. For this one, we're gonna say app.get, and the path for this one is going to be slash favorites. And the callback for this one is gonna be just as simple as the one for friends. We're gonna say response.json favorites. Okay, so we're sending back this array up here. And next up, let's do our individual friend endpoint. This one's gonna be a little more involved than the others but uh, it's still gonna be fairly simple. We're gonna say app.get, and the path for this one is going to involve URL parameters. It's going to be slash friends, and then we're gonna to wanna to have the friends ID that we wanna load the data for be the next segment of this path. And the way that we do that in Express is by saying colon friend ID. Okay, we can call this whatever we want. I'm just picking friend ID because that will basically make it clear what we're using that section of the URL for. And for the callback here, we're gonna have to start off by getting this ID from the URL parameters in Express, that's pretty easy to do. We're just gonna say const friend ID equals request.params.friendid. And we can simplify this as well by using object destructuring and just saying friend ID equals request.params. And once we have that friend ID, the next thing that we're gonna do is use that to filter out the correct friend from our friends array and send that back to the client. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say const friend equals friends dot find. And we wanna find the friend whose ID equals this friend ID URL parameter. So we'll say friend dot ID is equal to friend ID. Okay, and once we have that friend, we're gonna send that back to the client by saying response.json friend. And in situations like this, where we're trying to load a specific resource with a specific ID, it's usually a good idea to include some kind of logic for what should happen when the user is trying to load a resource that doesn't exist, right? If they're trying to load a friend, using an ID that doesn't belong to any of the friends in our database, we want to let them know. Now, the way that we do this in Express and just in REST APIs in general is usually by sending back a 404 response code. Most people are familiar with this response code. It's the one that you see when you try and go to a page on a website that doesn't exist. Um, it basically just means that whatever data you're trying to load isn't on the server, right? Or in the database. So. The way that we can do that here is friends.find, if there isn't a friend with that ID, friends.find will simply return undefined. So we can actually just check and see if this friend exists by saying if friend, then we wanna send back response.json friend. Otherwise, we wanna send back the 404 status code. And the way that we do that in Express is by saying status. 404. And in situations like this, where we're just sending back 404, we usually don't need to send back any kind of response body. Uh, you can send back an additional message if you want. You would do that by saying res.status. And then you could say .json message couldn't find that person or something like that. But generally, it's more than enough to just send back a 404 status code. Okay, so we'll say response.sendStatus404. Now you might also be wondering why we would wanna have both a friends endpoint for loading all of our friends and a friend slash friend ID endpoint for loading individual friends. Well, at the point our app is at right now, it's still fairly small and we only have, you know, maximum like 10 friends in our application at any given point in time. So there isn't really a pressing need for us to do this yet, but it is a good idea to have separate endpoints like this because when we're listing our friends, okay, it's generally a good idea for performance reasons to only return the information you need, right? So for each of these friends, 
what we'll be doing when we actually use our database. Uh, we're just going to send back the information that the page needs. So we'll just be sending back their name, uh, their age, and probably their ID as well. Because that's all that's needed on the friends list page. This endpoint, on the other hand, we're going to use on the friend detail page. And for that page, we need a lot more information, right? In addition to the information up here, we'll also need uh, things like their interests, right? Which is an array. Uh, we'll need their biography. We'll need basically all the other information that we put on each of the friend objects. And in an application with a lot more friends and a lot more information about each of our friends, we would definitely want to limit the amount that we load when we're listing them and, you know, allow ourselves to get much more detailed information by sending a request to the individual friend endpoint. So that's why we have separate endpoints for these two things. And finally, the last read endpoint we're going to implement here is the one for user profile data. And for this one, we're going to say app.get. And the URL for this one is going to be slash users slash user ID. Okay, now the reason that we're including a user ID and we're not just having this endpoint be something like user profile, the reason we're not doing that is because right now, right, our app has one user and that's hard coded into our database right here. However, as time goes on, right, and we uh, make our app much more functional and uh, you know, we add user authentication, that kind of stuff. As time goes on, we will have more users, so we'll want to allow ourselves to load those different users from this endpoint. And the way that we're doing that is in a pretty similar way to how we did our friends slash friend ID. We're going to do slash users slash user ID. And for now, we're just going to be hard coding that user ID when we load it from the front end because, you know, the user ID is pretty clearly just 999 in our fake database here. But you'll see that later on when we add user authentication to this app, which we're not going to do for a little while, but when we do, you'll see that we'll actually use this user ID to load different information for different users that are logged in. So that's why we're doing things that way. Okay, and the callback for this one is going to look a lot like our friends endpoint. We're going to start off by getting the user ID. So we'll say const user ID equals request.params. We're going to say const user equals, well, for now, we're just going to say uh, profile data, I suppose. So we're not actually even going to use the user ID right now, but we'll just leave it there uh, for when we do need it later on. And after that, we're going to say response.json user. Okay. And if you want, actually, I'm going to do this because uh, this, this just feels better. What I'm going to do is actually change this profile data in the fake database to a user's array. And then we'll just put the, uh, we'll just put the same logic inside this endpoint as we did for friends. So we'll say user equals users dot find. And we want the user whose ID is equal to friend ID or user ID rather that URL parameter there. Okay. And we're going to have to change this import up at the top to users as well. And we should do the same thing that we did here with our friend. We'll say if user exists, then we want to send this back. Otherwise, we want to send back a 404 status code. So we'll say send status 404. And this is currently a simplification, right? Because we're obviously not going to want users to be able to load other users information. So at some point when we add user authentication to this, uh, we'll have to actually go in and make sure users can only access their own information. But that's for later on. So we won't worry about it right now. For now, we're just going to do it this way. And those are all of the read endpoints for our server. You can check these out if you want by just opening up a browser and looking at the different endpoints. So we'll take a look at localhost 8080 slash favorites. And favorites is just an empty array for now. So uh, it looks like that's working because that's what we specified in our fake database file. We can check out our friends. We'll see we get a lot of information there as well. Oh, and it looks like we're getting undefined here. We'll have to go back and fix that because that's an environment variable that we were using. 
And let's check out friends slash ID. So we'll just do one, two, three. Sure enough, we see that our friend one, two, three is there. And let's check out users as well. We'll do users slash nine, nine, nine. Hit enter. And sure enough, we see that our uh, profile information gets sent back. All right, so let's go fix this undefined thing. This is in our fake database. We were using process.environment.public URL. We can still use that on our backend, but what we have to actually do is set that environment variable. Now, the way we can do this is by going into our package.json file and editing our dev script. So we'll do something like uh, public URL equals, and we're gonna set it equal to localhost 3000 because that's where we're currently storing our images for each of our users. Okay, and if we restart our server by saying npm run dev, it should actually set this public URL as an environment variable. And if we go back and refresh this, we should see localhost 3000 slash myprofilepic.png. And we'll probably wanna add HTTP to this as well, colon slash slash. Okay, so let's restart our server again, just to make that take effect. And the reason we have to restart our server to make that take effect is because we're actually making changes to the script itself, right? We're not making changes to our server code. So again, just to make sure that that worked, we're gonna refresh and we see that it now has the profile picture there. And that's all of the read endpoints for our server. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created the basic read endpoints for our server, let's head over to our front end and see how to make it actually load data from these endpoints. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna do on our front end in order to make that work is we need to set up a proxy. And basically remember that this helps us avoid cores errors, which we get when we're running our front end and back end on different origins. So the way that we add that to our front end is going to be by saying proxy and just specifying the URL of our backend here, which is gonna be HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8080. Okay, and if you have your front end running, you're gonna to need to restart it, okay, in order for that to take effect. Now, in order to make our application load data from these endpoints, there's a few places we're gonna to have to make changes. The main place is gonna be inside our favorites provider and our friends provider. Remember that both of these are currently just loading their data from local storage. Okay, so we're gonna basically have to change this so that it loads that data from the server when our app is first rendered. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Let's just leave these open. We're also gonna have to add loading logic to our user profile page. Remember that this page is also just getting its data from local storage, and it currently doesn't use context like some of our other pages. And last but not least, we're gonna have to switch over our friend detail page here to stop using context and start loading its data directly from the server, right? Because remember that I said our friend detail page is gonna use the endpoint for loading an individual friend's data. Okay, this will give us a lot more flexibility for what data we load on this page as opposed to on the friends list page. All right, so I suppose we'll start off with our user profile page because this one is gonna be the easiest one in my opinion. The first thing we're gonna do is get rid of all trace of local storage because now that we're storing data on our server, we don't want or need local storage except in certain situations, which I won't describe right now. But generally, we're just going to remove these and replace them with calls to the server. So uh, for update user info, I'm gonna remove local storage there as well. We're in fact, inside here, we're gonna have to actually make a request to our server to update the user info. We haven't gotten there yet, but we will. So for now, we'll just replace this with something like alert, and we'll say not implemented yet. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to remove this existing info from our user info state, and we need to actually tell our user profile page to load data from our server as soon as this page is first rendered. Now, the way that we do that 
remember is we use React's use effect hook like this, and we're going to basically create an asynchronous function inside this hook and call it. And that asynchronous function will make a request to our backend and basically set this user info state with the info that we get back. Okay, ah, and we also need to get rid of starting info here. We don't want this anymore, so we'll get rid of that. We'll get rid of that. The starting state for our user info is actually going to be null, and I'll show you how to avoid getting errors with that later as well. Okay, now our use effect hook, we're only gonna want that to be called when our page is first loaded, so we need to put an empty array as the second argument there, because otherwise it will be called whenever this component updates, so we'll be making a lot of server calls if we forget this, uh, which I definitely do from time to time. And next up inside this function here, we're gonna define an asynchronous function by saying const, we'll call it something like load user info equals async. And we're going to call that async function inside this use effect. And then we're gonna use the Axios library, which we've already seen earlier. To do that, we need to first install it into our project by saying npm install Axios and hitting enter. And while that's installing, we can just import that up here. So we'll say import Axios from Axios. Now, since this endpoint, as most of our other read endpoints are, all of them in fact, since this endpoint is a get endpoint, uh, we're just gonna use axios.get to make the request we want. So we'll say const user info, or response rather. I'll show you how to get the user info in a minute. Const response equals await axios.get and the URL is just the path since we set up the proxy. So we'll say slash users slash and we're gonna hard code the user ID, okay? Like that. And then we're going to say set user info to response.data. And that should take care of loading our user info for us. So if we run our app again by saying npm run start, it should open that up in a browser. And if we go to my profile, we're gonna see that unfortunately there is an error. And the reason that this error is happening is because remember that we set the initial state of our user info to null. So what's happening is when we try and display certain uh, pieces of our user inside the profile info component, okay? Uh, it's trying to access a property of null, which as all of us know, throws an error in JavaScript and causes the program to crash. So there's a few ways you can get around this. One way would be to simply set an empty object as the default value for user info. And I believe that that would fix it. Ah, so that would actually fix the error we were getting before, but now we see another error saying cannot read properties of undefined. So basically that just means that we have some nested properties in here that are causing the same kind of problem as before. And that's why I don't recommend this default value as an empty object approach. What I do recommend is setting the initial value to null and using another state variable, which I usually call something like is loading and set is loading. And its initial state is going to be true. And basically what we do is we use this is loading state variable allow our component to know whether it's finished loading its data or not and respond accordingly. So what we'll do is down here in our JSX, we'll say return and we'll use that is loading state variable to determine whether we should display the real DOM or just a loading message. So we're gonna use a ternary operator here. And if our app is loading, we're gonna just return a loading message like that. So it won't try and access any of the properties that were causing an error. Otherwise, it will display the actual DOM. So essentially, it won't display anything that requires that user profile data until we've already loaded it. Okay, so that'll get rid of the error we were seeing. The last thing we have to do is we have to remember to set is loading to false once we've actually loaded that data. Okay, so if we go back to our application now, we should see that that works. And the exciting part now is that we're getting all of this data from our server. Okay, this is coming straight from our server, which you can see if you open up your inspector window, go to network, and you should be able to find, if you refresh the page, 
should be able to find a call to 999 right here, or whatever you set your user ID to. And we see that we're getting this response, which is now being displayed inside our application. Cool, so that is our user profile page. The way that we're gonna implement data loading in our other pages and in our providers is gonna be pretty much the same, right? We're just gonna have two state variables is loading and user info. And we're gonna use a use effect hook to basically load the data from the server. So let's go into our friend detail page and do that same thing. What we're gonna do first is we're gonna get rid of the favorite IDs and friends that we're getting from our context, right? Because what we're gonna to wanna to do instead is get that from the individual friend endpoint on the server. So let's get rid of those for now. We are gonna to wanna to leave the toggle favorite function, which we'll be modifying uh, when we actually implement the endpoints for adding and removing favorites but uh, we can get rid of these. We're gonna wanna keep this friend ID use params because we're gonna use that to determine which ID we're gonna pass as the URL parameter when we load the friend, okay? So we'll keep that. Uh, selected friend, we don't need that anymore. Uh, is favorite, that one we are gonna wanna load as well and I'm actually realizing right now that we do wanna keep the favorite IDs and just get rid of the friends inside use context, okay? So we need the favorite IDs because we need to know whether this friend that we're loading is a favorite or not. So let's condense this all a little bit just to make it a little more readable. And the next thing we're gonna do is load our friend from the server. So the way we're gonna do that again is we're gonna say const friend, oops, we're gonna use the use state hook here. So we're gonna say const friend and set friend equals use state. The initial value for this is going to be null and we're also gonna set const is loading and set is loading equals use state. The initial value for this is gonna be true since when the component is first rendered, it's going to be loading, obviously. Okay, and next up, we're gonna use the use effect hook and we need to import both of those up here too, by the way. So we'll say use state, use effect and use context. And we're gonna load our friend data by saying use effect. We're going to define an asynchronous function in here, which we'll call load friend equals async. We're gonna use Axios as well. So we'll import that up here, import Axios from Axios. And we'll say const response equals Axios dot get. And we need to put a wait before that as well. Await Axios dot get. And the URL for this, we're gonna express in backticks because we're gonna be inserting this uh, friend ID up here into that. So we're gonna say load from slash friends slash, and then we're gonna insert the friend ID into here. Okay, and once we've got the response, we're gonna say set friend response dot data, and we're gonna set is loading to false. All right, so let's just call load friend now. And we need to set the second argument here to an empty array. And also we should set the dependencies of use effect here. And instead of an empty array for this one, we're actually gonna pass the friend ID because we do want this page to reload if that changes for some reason, right? Like let's say that we have a button on this page that allows users to see similar friends and that only causes the friend ID URL parameter to change, right? We would wanna reload the friend data here, which is why we're going to insert friend ID into this array. All right, so next up, we just need to check is loading and friend. And before we do that, we also have to say is favorite equals favorite IDs dot includes friend dot ID. And we only want to actually run this if our friend exists. So what we'll do is we'll say not is loading and favorite IDs includes friend ID. All right, and then let's go down to our JSX now. And we're already using a ternary operator here. So uh, what I'm gonna do instead is say, if is loading return just a paragraph tag with loading inside of it, okay? And that will basically just short circuit this component uh, and ignore all of this if is loading is true. Now we do need to go down here and change this to return friend 
instead of selected friend. Okay, we'll change it there and there. And that'll work for now. So let's save this and take a look at our application by going to our friend detail page. Sure enough, we see that this information is successfully displayed. Let's make sure that we're actually getting all of that from the server. Okay, so let's take a look here. Go to network, we'll refresh. And sure enough, we see that our friend Eva Hayes is getting loaded from the server successfully. Now, one other thing we do have to do on this friend detail page is handle an error when it occurs. So essentially, when we call axios.get, if we get back an error status code from the server, basically anything that starts with 400 or 500, uh, it's just going to throw an error. So the way that we handle that in JavaScript when working with async and await is just by using a try catch block like this. So we'll say catch, and if an error occurred, all we're going to do, um, we can just print that out to the console. For now, we'll just set is loading to false. Okay, and the effect that that will have, if we go back and take a look here, if we change this to just a ID that doesn't exist. Oops, it looks like I'm getting an error from this. So let's actually change this not is loading thing to friend. Okay, so we just want to make sure that our friend exists before finding out whether they're a favorite or not. Okay, so let's save that. And sure enough, we'll see, oops, couldn't find that friend if we try and look at a friend whose ID isn't in our database. Okay, so other than that, everything else is working and we've switched over our user profile page and friend detail page to both load their data from the server. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted our user profile page and friend detail page over to load data from the server, the next thing that we're gonna see how to do is convert our context providers over to load their data from the server. So remember that the data inside our friends provider and favorites provider is used across several different components. So essentially what we're gonna do is have these provider components load their data as soon as they're rendered, right? This will have the nice effect of basically having that data in our application uh, until the user refreshes the page or closes the tab and reopens it, etc. Now this is a little different than our pages that we've created because our pages, basically this use effect hook here that we implemented will be called whenever we come to this page, whether we've already loaded data on this page or whether it's the first time that we're visiting this page. So essentially having our data loaded inside providers like this does tend to give the impression of a little bit more performance because all of our data is loaded at the first moment when the user visits our site. And as they navigate around our site, they're really just looking at data that's already loaded instead of having to load that data every time they visit a different page. Okay, so anyway, let's take a look at how to convert over our friends provider and favorites provider components to load their data from the server. Let's start off with our favorites provider since this one will be a little bit easier to start with. So first of all, we're going to get rid of our local storage code here, since again, we're not going to be storing any of our state in local storage anymore. So we'll get rid of that. We're going to leave favorites IDs. The difference here is that we're going to be loading that from the server. So we'll set the initial value of that to an empty array. You can also set it to null if you want, but for, uh, for resources that are an array, I usually like to set that default value as an array. It just makes it a little easier. Okay, and for our use effect hook, we're going to basically remove this local storage thing here, and we're gonna change this over to actually load our data for us. So this is gonna look just like it did in our pages that we converted. We're gonna start off by importing Axios from Axios. And inside here, we're gonna define an asynchronous function, which we'll call load favorites equals async. Inside this function is where we're going to make our request to the favorites endpoint by saying const response equals axios.get. And we, of course, need to say await axios.get since it's asynchronous. And the URL here is going to just be slash favorites. Okay. 
And then we simply need to set our favorite IDs to the IDs that we get in this response. So we can say set favorite IDs response dot data. Okay, and we're also probably gonna wanna have a loading variable as well. So we'll say const is loading and set is loading equals use state and it will be true initially, actually. There we go. And then we'll set is loading to false down here once we've loaded our favorites. Okay, so now all we need to do is load our favorites here. And that should be all we need to do. Uh, one other thing, though, is that we actually do need to make this is loading variable available to the components that need it, right? And the way that we can do that is by going down here and adding it to our value object that we're uh, passing to our favorites context dot provider. So that'll look like this. We'll just say is loading and that will make it available if a page needs to display a loading message or something like that. Okay, and one other thing that we're gonna do is we're going to just remove this logic from toggle favorite for now and do the same kind of thing that we did before. We're gonna say alert not implemented yet just so we don't get confused and think that we're toggling favorites uh, on the server when we're actually still toggling them in memory. So uh, we're just gonna replace this all with an alert for now. And that should be all we really need to do for our favorites provider. So let's go into our friends provider and do basically the same thing. We're gonna get rid of the existing state and the starter friends. Okay, so we'll get rid of those. We'll be getting all of that data from the server. And our initial state for our friends is gonna be an empty array. We'll also just jump ahead and add an is loading state variable to our friends provider here. So we'll say is loading, set is loading. Initial state for that, you know by now will be true. And then we're gonna use this use effect here as our loading point. So we're gonna say const, we'll call this load friends equals async and we'll call this function like that, okay? So inside here, same drill, we're gonna say const response equals axios, uh, which was just imported for me automatically by my IDE, equals axios.get, that is await as well, and we're gonna say slash friends, and that will load all of our friends for us. Okay, and then we just need to set our friends to response.data, and set is loading to false. All right, and then just like we did in our favorites provider, we're going to stub out these two methods here, add friend and update friend. We're gonna say alert not implemented yet. And alert not implemented yet here as well. Okay, we might be reusing some of this logic, which is why I'm commenting this out instead of just deleting it. Uh, but that'll be something for later. So we'll say not implemented yet. Okay, and we'll also add a function while we're at it for removing friends because that's something we're gonna wanna do later on as well. So we'll say const remove friend equals, this will probably take the friend ID that we wanna remove and we'll say alert not implemented yet here as well. All right, so again, we're already passing our friends to the value of this provider. We need to also pass is loading, so we'll add that over here. And while we're at it, we'll just pass this remove friend thing as well. We'll say remove friend, and let's put is loading back here at the beginning, just to keep things organized a little bit. All right, and that should be all we really need to do for our friends provider, right? It should be successfully loading our friends from the server when we first load our app. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we need to find where the contexts for these two providers are actually being used, right? What pages they're being used in. So we'll just do a quick search for friends context. See where that's being used. Here, in fact, we can just say use context, friends context, and see where that is. So it looks like we have three pages where that's being used. So what we're gonna do here is we need to also get is loading. So we'll say is loading, and we'll just display a loading message if this is still loading the data from our 
uh, context. So we'll say is loading and display a loading message. If it is, we'll say loading. Otherwise, we'll display the regular DOM. Uh, next up, we're going to do our friends page. We want to do the same thing here. Now, in our friends page, we're going to have both of our favorites context and friends contexts loading their data from the server at the same time. And they both provide an is loading property with the same name. So we're actually going to have to rename this property to is loading favorites. And we're going to rename this one here to is loading is loading friends. Okay, that's just how you rename things using object destructuring syntax if you're not familiar with it. And what we're going to do is just create a new is loading variable that combines these two, right? We won't want to display the actual friends page until both our friends and our favorites are loaded. So we'll just say is loading equals is loading favorites or is loading friends. Okay, so it'll be true if either of these is true. And then we'll go down here. And uh, we can either use a ternary operator or we can just say if is loading return paragraph loading. Okay. And the last page that we're going to have to convert over now is our new friend page. Uh, this one is only using the add friend uh, function here, so we don't actually need to do anything there. Awesome. So let's head over to our application in the browser now and see if everything's working like it should be. All right, so it looks like our friends list page is working, right? It seems to be loading all of the friends from the server. And if we click on any of these, it's also loading its data. And likewise, if we go to the edit info, right, that seems to be working as well. Now we can't add any of our friends to our favorites yet to see if that actually works, but what you can do is inspect the network and make sure that you got all of the data that you were looking for. So if we take a look here at favorites, we can see that that just sent back an empty array. If we take a look at friends, we can see that that sent back all of our friends. And that's really all we needed to do inside our providers. So, so our app now is loading all of its data from the server. So it's technically from that standpoint, it is a full stack app even though uh, we're not doing things like adding to favorites or you know, allowing ourselves to edit people's information, add new friends. We'll get to all of that stuff later. But I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Converting a front-end application over to load all of its data from the back-end is one thing, but converting over our front-end so that every piece of interaction that the user has with our front-end is stored on our server is quite another. For one, this will require us to build out a lot of different types of endpoints and learn some different server-side concepts for actually modifying and deleting data in addition to just loading it and sending it back to the client. And that's what we're going to take a look at here today. We're going to be continuing on with the application that we've been working on and see how to make our friend tracker application make proper requests to the server so that the data there will be modified as desired. So that's our plan of attack. Let's get started. Okay, so let's start off here by implementing some of the create endpoints, and there's going to be two of those. One will be the endpoint for creating a new friend, and the other one will be an endpoint for adding new favorites. So let's open up our server file in our backend and add those endpoints. Okay, now we're going to add those down here. Okay, so we'll just kind of uh, group our endpoints here by the CRUD operation that they're supporting. So these ones will be read and down here we'll have create. And the first endpoint we're going to make is going to be for creating new friends. So that's going to be a post endpoint as I mentioned earlier. And the URL for this is going to be slash friends. So that's just kind of a restful convention. Whenever you want to create a resource, you send a post request to a URL that is that resource uh, in plural. 
Okay, so the idea here is that we're gonna be getting all of the information needed for a new friend from the client side. So essentially the client side is going to collect all that information in the new friend page. Okay, so it's gonna have a form like that where it collects all the information. It's then going to send that information in a post request to our endpoint here where we'll basically dissect that information and insert it into our database. Now we're still using a fake database, uh, which is just a JSON array at this point. So we're just gonna basically be pushing that data onto that array for the time being, but we will add a database later on. All right, so what the callback for this endpoint is gonna look like, uh, we're going to have the request and response as usual. We're gonna start off by getting the information that was sent along with the request. So essentially, we're just going to assume that all of that information is in the request body directly. So what we'll say is just something like new friend info equals request.body, all right? And do make sure before using request.body that you have this app.useExpress.json thing up at the top because otherwise request.body will always be undefined. All right, so now that we have our new friend info, all we're gonna do is push that onto our friends array up here. And to do that, we just have to say friends.push new friend info. All right, and then we're gonna send back our updated friends to the client side by saying response.json friends. Now, one other thing that we do actually need to do in this endpoint is generate a random ID based on this new friend info. Generally, doing things like, uh, you know, generating random IDs is not something we want to leave up to the client side, just because if someone knows what they're doing and they realize we're doing that on the client side, there are some unpleasant things they might be able to do uh, just by sending a request with an ID that conflicts with other users, that sort of thing. So to generate the new ID, what we're gonna do is we're going to install the UUID package into our project here. And we're gonna use that up here by saying import v4 as UUID from UUID. We're going to generate a new ID for this new friend by saying const new friend equals ID. We'll generate that ID here by calling UUID. And we're gonna get all of the existing properties from our new friend info by saying dot, 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 new friend info. All right, and then we're just gonna say friends.push new friend instead and send back our friends after we've done that. And you could send back just the new friend if you wanted to. There's not really a reason that we're sending back all of our friends, uh, except that, um, you know, that just makes it easier for the client side in certain situations. Cool, so that's our endpoint for creating a new friend. The next one that we're gonna implement is the endpoint for creating a new favorite. So this one is gonna be app.post slash favorites. And the callback is gonna be request response. And what we're gonna do here is get that favorite ID from the request body. And to do that, we're gonna say const we're going to assume that it's on a property called ID or favorite ID or something in the request body. So we'll have to say const, uh, or friend ID rather, we'll say friend ID equals request dot body dot friend ID. If you wanna use object destructuring to make it a little more uh, compact, you can do it like that. And we are gonna to have to keep this structure in mind when we're implementing the front end side of this as well, right? We'll just need to make sure that our request body on our post request has this kind of structure. So now that we have the friend ID, all we're gonna do is say favorites.push, and we're going to push that friend ID onto that array. Okay, and then last but not least, we're gonna send back our updated favorites to the client by saying response.json favorites. And those are our two endpoints there. So let's run our server now by saying npm run dev. We should see servers listening on port 8080. And if you wanna test these endpoints before we actually uh, implement the corresponding functionality on the front end, there are a few ways you can do that. 
the main way that I would recommend is by using a program called Postman. Okay, and Postman, all it is is just a very fancy user interface that allows us to custom craft our own requests that we can then use to test our server. And if you don't already have Postman, all you have to do is Google download Postman app and you should find it. Just look for this logo there uh, on that. So once you've gotten this downloaded, you should see a screen that looks something like this. I'm gonna click on this plus button up here to create a new request. And what you can see is that this lets you select the exact request type and URL that you wanna to send to your endpoints. This is something that you can't do from the browser directly, right? We were able to test our get endpoints from the browser because that's what browsers send by default. But when you get into other types of requests, it's easier to use a tool like Postman. Okay, so let's select post because we're testing two different post endpoints. And let's first test our new friend info endpoint here. So we're gonna send a post request to HTTP slash slash localhost 8080 slash friends. And we're gonna add a request body to this. And the way we do that is by clicking on this body tab here, going to raw from the radio buttons and from this drop down, selecting JSON. So this will basically let us specify the request body that we're sending in JSON. Okay, so what this is gonna look like, we're going to have the person's name that we're creating. Okay, so I'll just say something like John Doe. Uh, they're going to have an age, which I'll say something like, I don't know, 34. And for now, we'll just specify interests as well. We don't have to go through and specify everything here at the moment. So we'll just say interests, painting, skateboarding, and sailing, okay? Just for test, John Doe is gonna be gone as soon as our server restarts anyway, so you don't have to worry too much about this. Okay, so the way that we can test our server now is by clicking on send. And what we should see, we're gonna see the response that the server sends back down here. Okay, we should see that it sent back all of our updated people and that we see our old friends. And in addition, we see John Doe with this randomly generated ID uh, that we created using the UUID package. Cool, so everything looks good with that endpoint. Let's test out our new favorite endpoint now. The way we're gonna do that is by changing this to slash favorites. And we're gonna change the request body here to include uh, friend ID. Okay, and we can set that to whatever we want. I'm gonna do one, two, three. Oh, and we do need to add quotation marks around this since this is actual JSON and not just a JavaScript object. And yep, okay, that matches. Just wanted to make sure of that. So let's click send now. And we should see that that worked as well, right? And that sent us back an updated array of the favorites on our server. And that about does it for our two create endpoints. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we have our two create server endpoints implemented, let's see how to actually switch over the corresponding front end functionality to use those. Okay, so the two places that this is going to be important is inside both of our provider components. So you're gonna to want to open up favorites provider and friends provider. And the place that we're gonna be adding in the corresponding functionality for making requests to the two endpoints we just implemented are inside the add friend function, which we changed to just display an alert, and in our favorites provider, the toggle favorite function, which we're gonna have to do a little bit of logic on ourselves to make sure uh, that the right thing is being called. So let's start off with our friends provider. This one will be a little bit easier to do. And what we're gonna do is delete the logic that's inside of there and replace that with a server request. So first of all, let's change this function to an asynchronous function. And this friend argument here, if you'll remember, is the new data for the friend that we wanna add. So 
Uh, and you can always change that too to match what we had inside our server, right? If you take a look here, we were just expecting the new friend info to be part of the request body. So if it makes it easier for you to keep track, you can always change this name to new friend info like that. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty straightforward. All we have to do is say const response equals await axios.post, okay, since this is a post request. And the URL here is going to be slash friends. And the second argument here we're gonna pass is the data that goes along with the post request, so the request body. And that's just gonna be our new friend info. Okay, so now all we have to do uh, once we've gotten the response back from that server endpoint, and remember that that response is going to contain an array of all of the updated friends, what we can do is just say set friends to response.data. Okay, so that's one way to do it. And if we go and take a look, right, if we just open up our front end and go to the add new friend page and enter in, you know, some information here, we'll say John Doe age 34, we'll leave the profile picture URL blank there. And for bio, we'll just say likes sports, birthday, we're just testing this, so we'll just say Jan uh, 31st, and interests, sure, food, movies, travel, etc. Okay, and if we click on create now, what should happen is our app should send a request to the server endpoint, the server endpoint will add this new friend's information into the fake in-memory database and send us back an array of all of our friends, including the new friend, and that should be updated and displayed on the friends page when our app navigates us back there. So let's click on this create button and see if that assumption is correct. Oops, it says not implemented yet. Ah, and that is because I didn't actually run the front end before we checked that. So we were just seeing an old ghost of front ends past. So let's try that again. We're gonna say npm run start, make absolutely sure that this is the correct data. And it is now because we see that Eva Hayes is now in our favorites. That's from when we were testing our endpoints with Postman. And we see that John Doe is there as well. So if you wanna refresh your server and start with clean data, which I would recommend here, what you can do is just go into your server.js, kill it manually, and restart it. Okay, so we'll say clear, restart it with npm run dev, and we'll see that our server will be reset back to normal. Okay, so all of our data starts over from the beginning. All right, so let's try adding our new friend again. We're gonna add John Doe. We're gonna do the same information as before. Likes sports, January 31st and food, movies, travel, sure. All right, so let's click on create again. And we should see that John Doe is now there. And if we refresh our application, John Doe is still there, okay? And one thing to notice too, is that this data is on the server now, right? It's not being loaded from local storage like it was before. Cool, so creating friends works. The next thing we're going to convert over is adding people to our favorites. Okay, so essentially when we click on this button now, it says not implemented yet. Uh, so we're gonna need to go into our favorites provider and make that change here as well. All right, so we are actually gonna reuse part of this logic in our toggle favorite function because essentially we'll want to make a different request depending on whether that person is already a favorite or not, right? If they're already a favorite, we're gonna to want to remove them from our favorites. And if they're not already a favorite, we're going to want to add them to our favorites. So what that's gonna look like is we're just gonna test if our favorite IDs includes that person ID we're trying to add. So what we'll do, we'll say if favorite IDs dot includes person ID, in that case, we'll want to uh, you know, remove them from our favorites. So we'll just say alert not implemented yet because we haven't implemented that uh, server route yet. So we'll say not implemented yet. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is make a server request. So we'll say else. And inside here, we'll say const response equals await axios.post. We're gonna send a request to slash favorites. And the body here is going to be 
the friend ID that we want to add to our favorites. Okay. And you can either say friend ID, person ID, or you can just change the name of this to friend ID inside toggle favorite. Okay. So friend ID, just like that. And that should work. We do need to change this uh, function to async now as well. And what we're going to do once we get that response back is we're just going to set our favorite IDs up here to uh, the favorite IDs that we get back from the server. So we'll say set favorite IDs to response.data. Okay. And we'll delete that as well. And that should work now. So let's try adding people to our favorites with the full knowledge that we won't actually be able to remove them from our favorites once they're there for the time being. Okay, so let's head back to our front end. Oh, person ID is not defined. We need to change this to friend ID. Okay, let's go back and try adding one of these people to our favorites. And sure enough, it works, right? So we're able to add people to our favorites. And once we get there and click remove favorites, we get not implemented yet, which is more or less what we wanted to happen. Okay, so let's click on okay. And that does it for integrating create functionality on the server into our application. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've implemented the create endpoints on our server and hooked up our front end to those endpoints, the next thing we're going to do is write some more endpoints for deleting resources on the server. Okay, so there's going to be two main use cases for this. One is going to be for deleting friends, which is functionality that up until now we have not implemented on our front end even. And the second use case is going to be removing favorites from our application. So let's add those two endpoints now. What we're going to do is say app.delete. Okay, so we're going to be making delete requests for both of these. And we'll also just make a section for our delete endpoints up here, just like we did for create and read. All right, and the first one is going to be for deleting a friend. Now, the path for this is going to be slash friends slash friend ID. Okay, and that will basically delete the friend with this ID, uh, which our front end will specify. Okay, and the callback for this route is going to look like this. We're going to say request response. We're going to start off by getting the URL parameter up here. So we'll say const friend ID equals request dot params. Under that, we're basically going to set our friends array to the original array, but without the friend that has that ID. So what that's going to look like, we're going to say friends equals friends dot filter. And we want all of our friends whose ID does not match this friend ID URL parameter. So we'll just say friend, oops, that should be friend there. Friend dot ID does not equal the friend ID URL parameter. All right, and now that we've updated our friends, we're just gonna send those back to the client by saying response.json friends. Okay, and the client will receive an updated array without that friend that was just deleted. All right, pretty straightforward stuff. Next thing, let's allow users to remove favorites. And the way we're gonna do that is by saying app.delete. And this is going to be slash favorites slash friend ID. Okay, and this is just one way of doing it, right? You could include a request body on your delete request as well with the ID of the friend. Um, but this way just makes it a little easier in my opinion. And in here, we're gonna say request response. We're going to get the friend ID from the URL parameters like we did above equals request.params. And under here, we're going to basically remove that ID from our favorites. So we'll say favorites equals favorites.filter. And we want the IDs that are not equal to that friend ID. Okay, remember the favorites is just an array of IDs here. 
Okay, and just like in our delete friend endpoint, we're just gonna send back the updated favorites to our front end by saying response.json favorites. And those are the two endpoints that we need for the time being. So uh, let's test these out using Postman now. I'm gonna go back to here and we're gonna try and send a delete request to HTTP localhost 8080 slash friends. And I guess let's just try and delete friend one, two, three. All right. Let's also remove this uh, request body here. We don't need that right now. And what we'll do is click send. And it looks like we got an error. So let's go take a look. And oh, it looks like JavaScript isn't letting us modify this friends thing since we're importing it from another file. So what we can do in order to make this work is just clear out our friends array here. And I'm just gonna do that uh, like this. I'm just going to say while friends.length is greater than zero, friends.pop. Okay, so that will clear our array. And essentially we just want to get our new friends. So what we'll do is say new friends. We'll put that up above here. And after we've cleared out our friends array, we'll just say friends.push and we'll insert our new friends into there. Okay, so that should work. And let's see if that, uh, that little error goes away now. So let's click on send. Oops, it looks like new friends is not defined. Ah, const new friends. There we go. Let's try this again. All right, click on send. And sure enough, it looks like that worked. All right, so that removed that friend from our friends array in the database. So let's do the same thing with favorites. We're gonna need to make a little change there just like we did here. And there are other ways of doing this too, by the way, but uh, this is just the first way that came to mind. So we'll change this to new favorites equals. We're going to put this down here and we'll clear out favorites. So we'll say while favorites.length is greater than zero, favorites.pop. And then we'll say favorites.push new favorites. Okay, and then we'll send those new favorites, or well, just the updated favorites array back to the client. So it is a little bit janky to do it this way, and we are going to be replacing this with an actual database later on, so don't worry too much about it. Uh, it's just a little quirk that happens when you import things from other files. JavaScript doesn't like you reassigning those. So anyway, our app should be working now. Let's try removing a favorite. And in order to test that, we actually have to have a favorite in the first place, so we're gonna need to add one. Uh, so we're gonna send a post request to our add favorites endpoint, which is slash favorites. For the request body, we're gonna say friend ID, and we'll add, uh, well, since we removed friend one, two, three, let's add friend um, two, three, four to our favorites, I suppose. So we'll say two, three, four. Gotta put double quotes around these things since it's JSON, and let's try adding that to our favorites. Okay, so we have friend two, three, four on our favorites now. Uh, let's try removing them. So what we'll do, go to delete. We want to say slash favorites slash two, three, four. Click send, and we should see an empty array. Cool, so it looks like our two delete endpoints are working. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Cool, so that's working, and that was honestly pretty easy to implement. So the next thing that we're gonna do is implement our ability to remove friends. Now this one is actually going to require us to add a button for this, since currently there's no way to uh, actually call this function inside our app. But first we'll just, uh, you know, we'll just worry about calling this function. Uh, what we're gonna do is change this to make a request to the correct endpoint, so we'll say, uh, const response equals await axios.delete. And we're gonna send this to slash friends slash uh, friend ID, which we're getting from the arguments here. 
And we also need to convert this to an async function since we're using await. And once we get the response back, we just need to set our friends to the friends array that we got back in the response. So we'll say set friends response dot data. All right, so that's pretty easy to do. The one thing we need to do now is actually add a place in the app where this function will be called. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go into our friend detail page. So let's go into pages here, friend detail page, and we're gonna add it in here. So our friend detail page is going to have an extra action in addition to removing from favorites, editing info. Uh, we're also gonna add an action for deleting the friend. Okay, so we'll say action name, delete friend. And for the handler for that, we'll want to call the function that we're getting from our friends provider. So we need to go up here and get that from the context. So we'll say toggle favorite and remove friend. And we're gonna make this action handler here call that remove friend function with the friend ID. So we'll say remove friend and the friend ID, we're getting that from the URL parameters on this page, if you recall, right? We're getting that up here with the use params hook. So we can just say remove friends or remove friend rather, friend ID. And that should allow us to call that function. So let's go back to our page and see if that works. Oh, and we're also gonna want to actually send the user back to uh, the home page after we delete that friend because otherwise it will display a message saying that that friend was not found. Okay, so we'll say remove friend and since that's asynchronous, we're gonna wanna say await and add an async to this function here. And after that happens, we're gonna say history.push and send them back to the home page. Okay, since there's no longer a friend to look at on the friend detail page. So let's go back here now. We're going to try deleting, I guess we'll delete Carl. Sorry, Carl. And let's click on this delete friend button now. And oops, it looks like remove friend is not a function, so we must not be providing that correctly. Now it looks like we're passing it here. Oh, our problem is that we're getting it from the favorites context and it's from the friends context. So we actually need to add our friends context back to this component by saying const friends context or no, I'm sorry, uh, const remove friend equals use context friends context. And now that should work. So again, Carl is on the chopping block. Goodbye, Carl. Let's click delete friend. And it looks like we're getting an error. So let's try that again. What we're gonna do here is go to one of our other friends detail pages. So we'll go to friends one, two, three, and let's keep our inspector window open so that we can see what's going on here in the network. Okay, and we're gonna click on delete friend here. And what we'll see, let's take a look at what we're getting back from this. All right, and it looks like we're getting back the correct response, so it must be something else. Uh, I think I know what it is now. So it turns out that when we call this, uh, let's go to our friend detail page. When we call remove friend, if you recall how our friends page works, let's go back to that. Our friends page actually takes the favorites and maps them to a corresponding friend from our friends array. So what we're forgetting here in our friend detail page, we need to also remove the corresponding ID from that friend if they're in our favorites, okay? So what we need to do is we need to actually add a similar remove favorites function to our favorites provider, which will specifically remove that from the array. So uh, basically what we're gonna do is just add another function here called remove favorite. And for this, we'll say async friend ID. We're gonna just steal this logic from where we remove our favorite up here. So we'll put that inside there and add remove favorite here, okay, which we'll have to put above it. So we'll say friend ID, put this underneath here. And what we're gonna need to do now is just call this remove favorite function when we remove the friend inside our friend detail page. So we're gonna need to add that to our provider here. So we'll need to say toggle favorite and remove favorite. And inside here now, 
we're going to need to import remove favorite from our favorites context. So we'll say remove favorite. And down here, before we even remove the friend, we'll say remove favorite. So we'll say await remove favorite friend ID. Okay, so let's see if this works now. Ah, we're gonna need to restart our server, unfortunately, to make that work since the data is messed up. So let's restart this and go back and take a look. We're gonna refresh our page and see if this works now. So let's try deleting this friend. Sure enough, that works. Let's try it if our friend is a favorite. So we'll add Eva Hayes to our favorites. Click, click on delete friend. And sure enough, that works as well. So we had to do a little bit of troubleshooting there to get that to work, but we figured it out. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that our app gives us the ability to delete both favorites and friends in a full stack way, the final thing that we're going to take a look at here is how to create update endpoints and convert our front end over to use them. So let's head over to our server file again, and we're going to add those update endpoints right underneath our delete endpoints. Okay, so we'll say update. And there's two main endpoints that we're going to have here. One is going to be for editing our own profile data, and the other is going to be for editing our friend's data. So let's create those two endpoints. Now, both of these are gonna be put endpoints. And again, that's just a RESTful convention. When you create an update endpoint, you have a put request. And uh, basically that put request will just contain whatever updates or changes we wanna make to a given resource. So for the first one, updating our profile info, this is going to look very similar to what we did uh, when we wanted to load the user's profile information, we're again going to say slash user slash user ID to make this easier to expand later to include multiple users. So we'll go down here, change this put to slash users slash user ID. And for our request and response, what we're going to do is we're first going to get the updates that have been sent along with the request. So in order to do that, we're just gonna say const, we'll call this updated friend info equals request dot body. Okay, so we're gonna need to send our updated info along in this format. And in fact, since we've uh, inside our create friend endpoint, uh, we just had our new friend info directly on the request body. Why don't we do the same thing for our edit profile? Uh, endpoint here. So we'll just remove these curly braces and assume that the updated info is going to be the body itself. Okay, so now that we have the updated friend info, all we're going to do is go through our users and set the user with that ID to the new information that we received. So here's what that's going to look like. We're going to say const user equals users.find and we'll want to find the user with this user ID, which we haven't gotten from the URL parameters yet. Let's do that now. We'll say const user ID equals request.params. And then we're going to find the user with that user ID. So user, user.id is equal to user ID. And we're going to edit that user by saying user equals updated friend info. And that actually doesn't make sense as a name, does it? We're going to say updated user info. Okay. I was following the other endpoint too closely. So we'll change that to updated user info. And we might need to change this to let if it lets us do that at all. If it doesn't, we'll just have to come back and fix it. And finally, we're just going to send back the updated user data to the client by saying response.json. Uh, we'll say user. Or, you know, we can even change that to updated user info. It doesn't really matter at this point. Another thing that we can do, right, we could also say if user do this, right, just to uh, basically send back a 404 if there is no user with that ID. Okay, we can say response.send status 404. And let's give that a try, right? This thing might not work, but we will just have to wait and see. Let's first of all make sure our server's running. Yep, it is. 
So let's try and edit our user info by saying something like, well, we'll send a put request to slash users slash 999. Uh, our updated info here is going to just include name. Let's uh, change the spelling of my name here a little bit. We'll change my age to something else also. Say I'm 99 years old. And uh, let's just do those two things for now. That'll tell us if it worked, basically. So let's click on Send. And sure enough, we'll see that that sent us back the updated user information. And now if we try and load that user again, we should see that those changes have persisted, right? We'll say get users slash 999, click send. And it looks like that didn't actually work. So let's try that again. What we're going to have to do inside of here, instead of doing what I was trying to do there, which obviously didn't work, is we're going to have to say object.keys updated user info dot for each. And for each of those keys, we're essentially just going to set that key to the corresponding new value on our user. So we'll say user key equals updated user info key. All right, so let's see if that one works now. All right, we're going to check and make sure our server is running. We're going to go back here, make the request that we made before. We're going to send a put request with the name and age. We'll click send. And we'll get this back now. That's actually not what I was expecting to get back. So, ah, we need to just send back our user now, not updated user info. There we go. Let's try this one more time. Sure enough, finally, we see that we have our updated user sent back to us from the server. Okay, so we have ID 999, my name spelled differently. Uh, we're going to now send a get request to make sure that that was persisted appropriately. Click send, and sure enough, we see that those changes have been persisted. So that was a little trickier than I expected it to be, I will admit. Uh, but now we can move on to implementing the next endpoint, which will be the one where we can edit our friend data. Now this one is gonna be almost exactly the same as what we did here, just with our friends instead of the users array. So for that, we're gonna say app.put. This is going to be slash friends slash friend ID. We're gonna have our request and response. And I'm just going to copy this and paste it into here and we'll go through and edit each of these. Okay, so we'll change this to friend ID, change this to updated friend info. We'll change this to updated friend info as well. Updated friend info. And we'll change this to friends.find. Let friend, change this to friend, change this to friend, and change this to friend ID. We're almost there, I promise. And last but not least, down here, we're gonna say friend key, res.json friend, and if friend up here. Okay, so that should be all. I don't see any more users laying around. So let's try this one now. All right, we're gonna send this same kind of request uh, to a friend endpoint. So we'll say put friends slash, and let's edit friend one, two, three, I suppose. And we're gonna change that friend's name to, I don't know. We'll just change it to changed right now. And for age, we'll put uh, one, two, three. Okay, so we're gonna click send, and we should see that our friend has their name changed and their age as well. And if we send a get request to uh, our individual friend endpoint, we should see that those changes have now persisted. Cool, so we now have both our update friend and update profile info endpoints implemented. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've implemented both of our update endpoints on our server, the next thing we're gonna do is go and actually implement the corresponding logic on the front end that will actually use those endpoints. 
So there's going to be a few places we need to change inside of here. First of all, we'll need our friends provider. And we're also going to need to open up our edit friend page. So let's go to our pages here edit friend page, and we're going to need our user profile page as well. Okay, so essentially we're going to need to make it so that our user profile page, when we actually update our user info, this will have to make a request to the corresponding server endpoint. On our edit friend page, we're going to have to do the same thing in save updated information here. And in our friends provider, we're going to need to do this in update friend as well. Oh, and actually in our edit friend page, we won't need to do this because that's using the one in our friends provider. So we should be good with just changing our friends provider and our user profile page. All right, so we'll just start off with this one. We, all we need to do is swap out these two comments in this alert with an actual network request. So we're gonna need to import Axios, which we've already done at the top for loading our data here. We're gonna say const response equals await axios dot put and the url here is going to be slash users slash 999 again we're just hard coding that user id because our application currently only has one user and for the actual request body we're just going to put our updated info into there so we'll say updated info just like that and remember that this endpoint will send us back the updated user info so what we can do now is say set user info to response.data. And that's pretty much all we need to do to update our user info. Let's go into our front end in the browser now. Oops, so we need to change this to an async function in order for that to work. Let's go back to our user info and let's also update our server. We'll just manually restart it so that we have our data all back, right? We deleted most of our friends. So let's refresh this now, and we should see all our friends are back. So let's go to my profile. We're going to click on edit my info and make a few changes here to see if they persist. So let's just make some changes here. There we go. We'll do 10 years old, and uh, that should be about it. Let's click on save changes now and see if that works. Oh, so it looks like apparently something went wrong. So let's open up our inspector window, go to console. And it looks like nothing's happening here, but that's just because we forgot to call set is editing and set that to false after we're done here. So uh, we're gonna say set is editing false, okay? And that should make it so that when we click save changes, it sends us back to our My Profile page with the updated data. And just to make sure that's updated on the server, let's refresh the page and we should see that that change persists. So I'm gonna actually edit that, change it back here and click on save changes and we should see that it's back now. Cool, so now we just have to do the same thing for our friends page, which we can do via the friends provider. Okay, so we're gonna delete all of this here. We're gonna delete the alert and we're gonna do basically the same logic that we had before inside our user profile page. What we're gonna do is say const response equals await axios.post, or actually this is gonna be at axios.put, okay? And we're gonna make a request to slash friends slash uh, and insert our friends ID. So we're gonna get their ID from updated info here. We'll say const friend ID equals updated info dot ID and insert that into here. So we'll say friend ID like that. And the payload here is going to be our updated info. So we can say updated info like that. And once we get that response back, we're gonna set our friends to the updated friends info by saying set friends response dot data. Oops, I spelled response wrong. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so uh, one last thing we're gonna do. Let's just open up our edit friend page to make sure we're sending the user back. It looks like we are after we call update friend, so it's taken care of by that. We do just need to change this to asynchronous since uh, we have an await keyword in there and that means we'll have to await in here as well and change this to async as well. Okay, so that should be all we have to do. Let's go and try and edit one of our friend's information now. We're gonna go back here. We'll edit Eva Hayes. 
Click on Edit Info. We'll change the spelling of Eva's name, I suppose. Click on Save Change. Oops, and it looks like we got an error. The reason this is happening is because in the server, we're actually not sending back all of the people. We're just sending back that updated friend. Okay, so what we want to do instead is send back our friends here. So we're going to say res.json friends. Okay, so let's try that again. We might have to restart. There we go. So let's try changing that to YVA. Click Save Changes, and sure enough, those changes are persisted even when we uh, refresh our server. Cool, so we've seen how to create server resources from React. We've seen how to delete them, and we've seen how to update them. So at this point, with the exception of the fact that we're obviously not using a database yet, our application is truly a full stack app. So congratulations on converting that, and I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Probably one of the biggest questions I get asked by people who are already familiar with React and basic full stack concepts is how do I add user authentication to my applications in the quickest and most secure way possible? In other words, how do I add user authentication to my apps without all of that added complexity that generally comes along with it? Well, almost always my response to that question is two words, Firebase Auth. Firebase Auth is a service provided by Google that makes it incredibly easy to add user authentication to your applications without having to manage any of the difficult stuff yourself. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. We're going to be seeing the basics of Firebase Auth and how to add it to a React application in order to allow ourselves to let our users log in. And we're also going to be seeing how to create routes that will only allow certain users to see the pages they contain. So, Without further ado, let's jump right in and see what all this stuff is going to look like. All right, so before we start seeing how to incorporate Firebase Auth into a React app and, you know, how it lets us actually add user authentication to an app, let's talk a little bit about what Firebase is in the first place. So think about Firebase as kind of a user-friendly wrapper around Google Cloud Platform. If any of you have ever used GCP or Amazon Web Services or Azure or one of those other providers before, chances are you've found that it's actually quite difficult to set up an application and make sure that it's performant and ready to serve thousands, if not millions, of users. Right? That, that's why those kind of certifications exist, because there's a lot you have to learn in order to make a lot of that stuff work. So what Firebase is, is essentially a wrapper around GCP, as I said, that takes care of a lot of that for you. Right? And it has a lot of different products that are available. It's got Firebase Auth, which is what we're going to be taking a look at here today. And it's also got other things like database providers, which is uh, called Firestore. It's got a storage solution, which is called cloud storage. There's a lot of other options for products that you can use on here. But right now, we're just going to be taking a look at Firebase Auth, which, as you may have guessed, is Firebase's user authentication provider. So let's talk about some of the benefits of Firebase Auth. First of all, one of the main benefits of Firebase Auth is that it is free. And yes, this is probably just to get you hooked on Firebase Auth and start using some of the other paid products that Firebase provides, but hey, I'll take it, right? This is something you generally don't get from other Auth providers. Now, the one exception to this is, of course, if you're using uh, cell phone authentication, that kind of stuff, in which case it costs you money because you're actually sending texts to users' phones. But in general, right, for any kind of password-based authentication for OAuth, etc. Firebase Auth is free regardless of how many users you have. Okay, so that's the first main benefit. The second main benefit is that Firebase Auth takes care of nearly all the complexity behind implementing user authentication. So user authentication is obviously a very complex thing and you have to worry about uh, lots of security things 
right? That really has a huge influence on how your company behaves, right? If you're starting a, if you're creating a startup, you have to worry about keeping all your data secure, et cetera. And those are things that you have to worry about anyway, but the fact that you can just kind of give Firebase your users passwords, emails, et cetera, and know that you have Google protecting all of that, right? You have a basically a team of people who spend all day, every day, making sure that those things are secure. That to me is a very comforting thought. So security is the second main benefit of Firebase Auth. It makes it so that you don't have to implement your own authentication, you don't have to store users' passwords, etc. And the third main benefit of Firebase Auth is that in general, it's incredibly easy to use. Now what you're gonna see when we actually add this to a React project is that essentially, in order to log a user in in Firebase, all you have to do is call a single Firebase function, which will actually log them in, and it'll take care of keeping track of all of the tokens, storing all that stuff in your browser, etc., behind the scenes, without you even having to think about it. Literally, all you do is call uh, Firebase's login and logout functions to log a user in or out. Very straightforward, and I think you're going to like it. So those are the main benefits of Firebase Auth. We're going to see these all in action. So let's jump into seeing how this is going to work uh, in a React project. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we know what Firebase Auth is and some of its benefits, the next question is, how do we add it to a React application? Well, in order to answer this question, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new application from scratch, and we're going to see how to install Firebase, how to set it up, how to create the login pages that are necessary, and that's about it. So let's get started. We're going to generate our project by saying npx create react app. We're going to call this project Firebase Auth basics, and we're going to add the use npm flag because we want to use npm as our package manager instead of yarn. You don't have to do that, but uh, that's going to be my preference here. So let's hit enter, and that will generate a React project for us. And once that project's been created, the next thing that we're going to do is open it up in our IDE. What I'm going to do is just say cd firebase auth basics and going to open that up in Visual Studio Code. And there we have it. So what we're going to do first is we're going to create the pages of our application. And really right now, we're just going to have two main pages. We're going to have the login page. Okay, this is just going to be fairly straightforward. It's going to have a text box for putting in the user's email and one for entering in their password and a button that will let them log in. And we're also going to have a home page, which is just going to display some basic information about the user, right? So it'll display things like their email, their user ID, etc. And we'll see how to add some other stuff to this a little later on. But the main point of what we're going to be doing here, after we've created these two pages, is we're going to see how to make it so that only authenticated users can access the home page, and only users who are not authenticated, right, users that need to log in, can access this login page. So in other words, we're gonna see how to specify routes that users can only access when authed or unauthed. So in order to get started with that, let's create a new folder called pages, which is gonna contain all of the pages for our application. And inside here, we're gonna create our login page.js, and we're gonna create our home page.js. And just as a side note, uh, one thing that always kind of confuses me and throws me for a loop is the casing behind login. Now the difference here, the difference between login with a capital I and login with a lowercase i is that login, this is supposed to be a verb, linguistically speaking, and this is supposed to be a noun. So essentially... So in other words, when we say login page up here at the top, we could really choose either, right? We could either say this is the page that allows users to log in as a verb, or we could say this is just the, the 
page where the login happens. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to point that out because you might see that throughout this course, I end up using these interchangeably, and it can definitely cause a few typos and a few errors when you end up capitalizing an I and you say, you know, login page instead of login page with a lowercase i, etc. Stupid thing, but I just wanted to point that out. Anyway, let's get started creating our pages here. Uh, each one of these is going to be fairly straightforward. For the login page, what we're going to do is we're just going to say import use state from React. We're going to be using this for our text inputs, right? The email and password text inputs. And then we're going to export our page by saying export const login page. Again, we're using a lowercase i. If you want to use a capital I, be my guest. And it's not going to take any props. It's just going to uh, basically return some JSX. Okay, we're going to put this all inside a React fragment. Okay, and then we're going to have an h1 heading where we say login. And under that, we're going to have an input. The placeholder for this input will be enter your email. Uh, and then we're going to have a value, which will be a state variable, and we'll also have on change, which will be a state variable. We'll come back to those in just a minute here. Now, underneath that, the next thing we're going to do is have another input, which is going to be a password input. So we'll want to add type equals password to this so that it, you know, doesn't display the letters. It'll just show those little dots instead. And for this one, we're going to have the placeholder say, enter your password. And we'll have a state variable for that one as well. Now, below these inputs, we're just going to have a button, which when clicked, we'll say on click, is going to basically call a special login function that we'll define up here. So we'll just say const log in. And here's a case where we end up using this as a, as a verb because... Um, you know, this is actually telling our component to log in. It's we're, we're specifying it as an action. Again, stupid thing. Don't worry too much about it, but I just wanted to point out why there's that case difference there. Uh, anyway, that's going to be called when this button is clicked. We're going to say log in. And for this button, we'll also say log in with a capital I, because again, the text of buttons is usually a verb and log in. Two words is the verb form of this. So anyway, that's our login button and the rest of our elements for our login page. So let's actually create the state variables for our email and password inputs. We're going to say const email and set email equals use state. You know the drill here, empty string. And for password, we're going to say const password set password equals use state empty string. And then down here, we're going to say value email on change E. Uh, we're going to do set email e.target.value. Same thing here for uh, our password input. Value is going to be equal to password. And on change is going to be set password to e.target.value. Pretty straightforward React form stuff. So the next thing that we're going to do, well, right now, what I'll do is just... Uh, I'm just going to do something that you probably don't want to do in production. We're going to just display the email and password when the user clicks that button, just to make sure that we have everything hooked up correctly. We're just going to say alert, and we're going to say email, email, and password. Password. And that should happen again when we click on this login button here. So that's going to be our login page, and we'll we'll test that in just a minute when we add routes. But first, let's add a home page. Uh, for now, it's going to be super simple. We're just going to say export const home page equals. It's not going to take any props, and it's just going to say return. And we'll just have an h1 heading here that says home. Okay, so pretty straightforward stuff. The next thing we're going to do is actually add routes for each of these pages. And we're not going to do the thing yet where we actually prevent a user from going to a route if they're authenticated or not authenticated, but we will get to that very shortly. So uh, first, we're going to need to 
uh, install the React Router DOM package. We've looked at this earlier. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend going back and taking a look at it. Uh, so first of all, we're going to say npm install React Router DOM and hit enter. And that will install that package for us. Uh, so now all we have to do is we're just going to open up app.js and add routes for both our login and home pages. What that's going to look like, we're just going to remove all of the basic boilerplate that they gave us when we generated our project. Um, I'm just going to adjust the indentation here. There we go. And I'm going to delete the logo and app CSS. And what we're going to do is just import the browser router as router. We're going to import the switch component and we're going to import the route component from React Router DOM. And we're going to use those components to display both of our pages at their corresponding routes. So what this is going to look like, we're just going to wrap everything inside a browser router here, or router rather, since we renamed it up in the imports. We're going to wrap everything in a switch to make sure that only one of our routes displays at a time and that our routes re-render correctly when the route changes. That's something we'll talk about later on. And finally, we're going to display a route for each of these. We're going to say route. For our home page, the path is going to just be a regular slash, and we're going to have to say exact there to make sure that it only shows up uh, when it's exactly that route. And under that, we're going to display our home page which was just automatically imported for me. And next up, we're gonna define a route for our login page. This one's gonna look pretty simple. We're just gonna say path equals slash login. We don't have to say exact there. And we're just going to display the login page inside of there, which again was uh, automatically imported. Okay, and just to make sure that everything works, let's run our application now. We're gonna say npm run start and hit enter. And that should run our application for us. Okay, so what we're going to see is that the home page shows up at localhost 3000. And if we go to localhost 3000 slash login, we'll see our beautiful little login page, which doesn't really have any styling or anything, but nevertheless, it'll work for our purposes. And also note that you probably won't see these little things here. That's just from my password manager, so just ignore those for now. So anyway, let's just enter in something for our email. I'm just going to say sean at gmail.com. And for password, I'm just going to enter in something simple. And if we click login now, we should see that we have both our email and our password uh, that are being correctly picked up on by our login page. So those are the two pages for our application. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so at this point we have both our login page and home page, which are being displayed at their respective routes. So now the question is, how do we make it so that users can only visit the home page if they're authenticated, and they can only visit the login page if they're not authenticated? Okay, so there's actually a few different ways we could go about this. One way that we could go about this, which is generally considered to be the more complex and uh, error prone way would be inside each page to actually check if a user is authenticated. And if they're not authenticated, then basically redirect them back to the login page and vice versa for the login page. We want to check if they're authenticated. If they're already authenticated, we want to send them to the home page. So the way that we can do this in React is by using a special component from the React Router DOM package, which is called redirect. So essentially what this redirect component does, I'm just gonna import that here, import redirect from React Router DOM. Essentially what this component does is if it gets displayed inside JSX, right, inside the JSX of any component, it will try and redirect the entire application to a different URL. To show you what I mean here, let's imagine that our home page uh, is checking to see whether or not our user is authenticated. For now, we'll just say const is auth equals false. Okay, let's just imagine that they're not authenticated, so we'd want to redirect them. What we could do in this case, if we wanted to use this redirect component now, 
is we would basically say return is oft. And basically, if the user's oft, we're going to return the regular home page. Otherwise, what we would do is we would return the redirect component. Okay, now the redirect component, what it looks like when we display it in JSX, we say redirect and it takes a single prop called to, and that will basically tell the application where to redirect to, okay? As you might've guessed by the name of the prop. So essentially what this will do is if is oft is false, which just for testing purposes, we've set it to false here, it will display this redirect component which will automatically redirect the user to wherever we specify here. So in other words, if is oft is false here, we're going to send the user back to the login page. To see what this looks like, uh, what we're gonna do, our application's still running, so let's just head back and take a look. If we try and go now to localhost 3000, what we're gonna see is that immediately it redirects us to the login page. Okay, so that's exactly what we want with that. So everything's working out well there. So let's do the opposite now with our login page. Okay, our login page, what we could do is we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna import the redirect component from React Router DOM. Not sure why it wanted to import that from React Router because that wouldn't work. But uh, anyway, the next thing that we're gonna do is say const is oft, and again, just for testing purposes here, we're gonna say equals true. So we're gonna simulate what would happen if uh, the user was already authenticated. And just to make this work, let's change is oft to true here as well. Okay, so that it doesn't get it stuck in an infinite loop of redirecting back and forth between these two pages. Okay, and then what we would do is we would just say return is oft, and if the user's already off, in that case, what we wanna do is uh, display the redirect since we don't want the user to be able to visit the login page if they're already authenticated. So we're gonna say redirect to, and we would send them to the home page in this case. And that's all we'd really have to do on this page. So the next thing, let's just test this out, I suppose. We'll try and go to slash login and hit enter. And sure enough, it will just automatically redirect us to the home page. All right, so that's one way of doing it. And, you know, as I said before, this is generally considered to be the more error prone way of doing this. Now, you might wonder why that is, because honestly, the logic that we've written here seems pretty simple. It's literally like three lines that we've added to these components. Well, the reason that I don't recommend doing it this way is because in general, the logic for redirecting users uh, and authenticating all that kind of stuff gets a lot more complicated than what we have here, right? This is the nice, clean, shiny, new, uh, you know, new application here that only has two or three lines for this logic. But in general, things can get pretty complex, right? Imagine that, let's say, different users had different permissions and you only wanted admins to be able to visit a certain page and you only wanted non-admins to be able to visit another page and you only wanted members of some group to be able to visit the group page, so on and so forth. Um, the point here is that with this kind of logic, we generally want to encapsulate it inside its own component. So that's what we're gonna do. What we're gonna do instead of actually having each page worry about its redirecting logic is inside our app component, we're actually going to use a different component than this route here. Essentially, we're going to just create our own component, which we'll call auth route and unauth route. So we're gonna create two here. And those are basically gonna be what take care of all the redirecting logic. And that'll leave our pages free to just, you know, be happy, carefree little pages and not worry about all this big, bad uh, user authentication stuff. So uh, let's see what that would look like. What we're gonna do is create a new folder inside our source folder, which we'll call uh, components here. And we're gonna create two new components inside of here. One of them, as I said, is going to be called auth route. And the other one, uh, we're just going to give it the name unauth route, not super creative, but it works. And here's what these are gonna look like. Essentially, each of these, we're gonna say export const auth route. Each of these components is going to take some props 
First of all, it's gonna take a prop specifying whether or not the user is authenticated. So we'll say is auth. And then it's just gonna take the rest of the props that get passed to it. You'll see why it does this in just a second, but we do need to get all of those other props by using the spread operator here. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do, right, we're gonna use that same redirect component that we saw earlier from React Router DOM. So we'll say import redirect from React Router DOM. And all we're gonna do for this auth route is we're gonna check if the user's auth, and if they are, we're going to just return a regular route component. Otherwise, we're going to return a redirect component. So uh, in other words, what we're gonna do is say return is auth. We're gonna use a ternary operator here, and we're gonna say, if the user's auth, we want to just display a regular route. And here's why we did the spread operator thing with the props. We're just gonna pass all of the props through uh, to our route component by saying dot, dot, dot props. And essentially what that'll do is if the user's auth, this thing is just gonna behave exactly like a regular route component, all right? Okay, so that's if the user's auth. Otherwise, we want to display that redirect. So we're gonna say redirect and send them to the login page where they will have to put in their email and password. Okay, so that's our auth route. Our unauth route is gonna look almost identical to this one, except it's going to be reversed. So what I'm gonna do is just copy and paste this code here, paste it into unauth route. We're gonna to have to change the name here, unauthed route. And essentially, we're just going to reverse these things by putting the route below the redirect. So in other words, if the user's already authenticated, we're going to redirect to, and we're gonna change this to the home page here. Okay, so if the user's already authed, we're gonna send them to the home page. They don't need to be at this unauthed route. Otherwise, if the user's already authed, it's just gonna behave exactly like a regular route. All right, so now that we have our auth and unauthed route components, let's actually add those to our app component. And the way we're gonna do that, we won't need this route anymore. I'm just gonna remove that. Oh, and actually, now that, I, uh, now that I've done that, I realized that we have to first import the route component into both our auth and unauthed routes. So let's just say import route from React Router DOM. Oops, here, we wanna put that right here redirect and route. And same thing for unauthed route, we're just gonna say redirect, and we want to import the route component as well. All right, so now in our app component, we're just going to import both of those routes we defined. We'll say import authed route from dot slash components slash authed route. Same thing for our unauthed route import unauthed route from components slash unauthed route. Okay, and now we just have to replace these things with whatever we want, uh, you know, whatever the equivalent component here would be. For our home page, this is strictly an auth route, so we're gonna replace the route here with auth route. And for our login page, this is going to be an unauthed route. So, oops, I changed the wrong one there. Unauthed route and unauth route. And I forgot to do this one, auth route, there we go. Okay, so now this should all work without either of our pages having to know about it. So what we can do is just delete the redirect from both our home page and login page. So we're just gonna return the home heading in this one, just like that. And here, let's remove is auth as well. We don't need that. And in our login page, we're gonna remove redirect. We're gonna remove is auth. We're going to remove this redirect and we're just going to return the regular JSX from before. Okay, so everything should be working. Doesn't look like we have any errors. Let's take a look now at our application. Oh, first, what we need to do is actually pass in is auth uh, from our app component. So as you're gonna see, what we're gonna do here is have our app component be the one, at least temporarily, that controls whether or not the user's auth, right? So what we'll do is say const is auth equals, and let's just try it with false first. 
So for this one, for the auth route, we're gonna have to pass in that is auth prop that we defined. So is auth is auth. And for unauth route, we're gonna say is auth is auth. And now it should work. Let's just go back here. And if we try and go to the home page now, what you'll see is that it doesn't let us. And likewise, if we change is auth to true, there we go. And I'm gonna save it. What you'll see is that it won't let us go to the login page. It automatically redirects us to the home page. So that's how we create both auth only and unauth only routes in React. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've got our application pretty much set up to handle authentication logic, right? It's We've got these routes that automatically redirect users. We've got a login page, a home page, etc. Let's actually see now how to add Firebase auth to our application so that we can allow users to, you know, log in with their email and password. So the first thing that we're going to do here is install the Firebase package into our front end. So we'll say npm install. Firebase, okay? And we just install the entire Firebase package like that. Firebase auth is just a subset of that that we end up using. You'll see what that looks like in just a minute here. But while that's installing, let's actually head over to the Firebase console because what we need to do in order for Firebase to really work in our React app is we need to set up a Firebase project that will basically take care of managing all of our users, storing all their emails, passwords, etc. So what you're going to want to do is go to firebase.google.com and you're probably going to have to log into this if you don't already have a Gmail account. Um, and what you're going to do is essentially just click on go to console here up in the right hand corner and that'll take you to what's called the Firebase console. Basically this is your control panel for all of your Firebase projects. So what we're gonna do here is create a new project. And you see, I already have this Firebase Auth Basics one here. That's just the one that I was using for testing earlier. So ignore that one. What we're gonna do is click on add project. And then we're just gonna have to give Firebase a few details about our project. So the first thing is gonna be the project name. Now this one can be really anything we want it to be. It's just an internal identifier. So no users are going to see it. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is say, React Firebase Auth Basics. I don't think that's what I called my other one. And what you'll see is that as you type that, you have this little thing down here that appears as well. Now this is the project ID, and this is something that you cannot change and that the user may see. So you're gonna want to be careful about what you end up having here, right? Don't go putting in any uh, inside jokes or anything that you don't want users to see. You know, generally, uh, Firebase will just generate something automatically for you. Uh, it does have to be unique across all of Firebase, so you may well find that your favorite uh, string there is already taken. Now that we've done that, we've put in the project name. I'm going to leave the project ID uh, the way it is, and we're going to click on Continue. Next thing, it's going to ask us if we want to have Google Analytics enabled for our Firebase project. I'm going to turn that off since that's just added complexity that we don't really need right now. And I'm gonna click on create project now. Okay, so this little spinner thing is going to run for a little while. And once it finishes, we're basically going to have to add what's called an application to our project. So let's click on continue. And sure enough, right under where it says, get started by adding Firebase to your app, you're gonna to want to click on this web icon here. Now, first of all, uh, just, just as a side note with Firebase, Firebase does let you add, uh, you know, iOS apps, Android apps, and even games that you create with Unity. Uh, and, you know, it allows you to basically use Firebase's services for those things. But for now, right, since we're developing a web application, we're going to use uh, this web app. And applications in Firebase, by the way, are just another word for platforms, right? So you could have, as we saw, an iOS application, an Android application, a web application, etc. So we just need to let Firebase know that those exist here uh, 
by basically creating one of those for our React app. So for our app nickname, we're gonna say something like React Frontend. We're gonna leave this Firebase hosting thing unchecked. That is another service that Firebase provides for us if you're interested in that. Uh, basically, it will host your app for you, but we're gonna leave that for now. And we're gonna click on Register App. That will spin for a second or two and then it will spit out some code here. So we already ran npm install Firebase in our front end. So the next thing that we have to do is copy all of this code that they gave us here. I'll describe what it is exactly in just a minute, but let's just copy that right now. And we're gonna head back over to our React app and open up the React entry point, right? So that's this index.js file here. So what we're gonna do is paste this code now into index.js before where we say react dom.render. Okay, and then we're just gonna delete these comments. We don't need those. And we also don't need app. We can just say initialize app Firebase config. Okay, so what is going on here? Essentially what this Firebase config thing is, it just contains some unique identifier strings that will basically tell our React project what URLs to contact and what IDs to use in order to actually uh, allow our users to log in, right? In order to do database stuff if you end up going with Firestore, etc. So these things here also, they're not sensitive information, right? These are public information that gets sent to the client anyway. So don't worry, it's perfectly fine to commit these to GitHub. So don't worry, just because it's a big, long, random looking string, it's not actually a secret key. Anyway, that's how Firebase is set up. Essentially what this does, again, it tells our application all of the unique identifiers and URLs for our Firebase project that we created, right? This project and app that we created over here in the console. And, you know, it just helps it link up correctly to those. So now that we've initialized our Firebase app, essentially what we'll be able to do is in the rest of our application, in our components, etc., we'll be able to actually make calls to Firebase auth, and that will allow us to create users, to let users log in, etc. Okay, so let's first just go back though to our uh, Firebase console. We're gonna click continue to console, and that should be about all we need to do. All right. So the next thing that we're gonna have to do is inside our login page, we're gonna have to add a little bit of logic that will allow a user to actually log in. Now, where this is gonna happen is inside this login uh, function here, we're gonna remove our alert. And instead of doing that, we're actually going to make a call to Firebase, right? To Firebase auth, telling Firebase auth to log in the user with the corresponding email and password. So first of all, what we're gonna need to do is import a few things from Firebase. So we'll need to say import get auth and sign in with email and password. That is, as you may have guessed, the function that we'll call to actually log in the user. And those are both imported from the Firebase package and specifically slash auth, right? So that's a sub package of Firebase. Okay, so now inside this login, what we're gonna do, it's gonna need to be an asynchronous function, first of all. And what we're gonna do is just say uh, const auth equals get auth. This basically just gets a reference to Firebase auth. And then what we're gonna do is say await, sign in with email and password. We're gonna pass the auth object to this as an argument. So auth, and then the second and third arguments are the email and password that we've collected from the user here in our login page. So we're gonna say email and password, and that will take care of logging our user in. All right, so just to show us that that's actually happened successfully, we're gonna say alert, and we'll say successfully logged in. And that should be about it. So before the user can actually log in, however, we're gonna need to actually create a user in Firebase Auth so that we'll have a matching account with the email and password that we're gonna use, right? You'll notice that we haven't yet created a create account page 
over here in, uh, in our pages folder. That's something we'll get to later, so don't worry about it. But for now, what we can do, we're gonna go into authentication in our Firebase console. We're gonna click on this get started button here, which should activate Firebase auth for our project. And then down here in this box, right, you can see uh, that these are what are called sign-in providers. Basically, uh, these are just different ways that you can allow users of your application to sign in. So you can see that in addition to email and password, which is what we're going to be using here, there's also Google, Facebook, Play Games, Game Center, Apple, GitHub, Microsoft, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of different uh, providers that you can use to allow users to log into your application. And that's something that we'll see later on as well. But for now, let's just select email and password. We're gonna flip this little switch next to email and password up at the top that says enable. We're gonna click on save and that's all we should need to do. So now that we've activated this email password provider, what we're gonna do is click on the users tab up in the top left. We're gonna click on add user and here's where we're going to add the first user to our application that we're going to uh, actually be able to log in with. So. For the email, I'm just gonna say sean at gmail.com. And for the password, I'm gonna say abc123 exclamation point. We can click on add user now, and that will create a new user in our application. Now note also that this is not something that you'll generally do, right? Creating accounts for users, unless you're working in a very exclusive application where users have to actually contact you before you can create an account for them. Uh, you're probably not going to be doing this. The only reason we're doing this here again is just because we don't yet have a create account page. So now that we have this account, uh, let's see how we can log in with it. What we should be able to do is just go to our login page. Uh, here, what we're going to need to do first is actually change is auth to false. Okay. Oops, we need to run our application again. Okay, we'll say npm run start and there we go we can see it goes immediately to our login page so let's enter in the email that we created the account for mine is sean at gmail.com and then for the password abc123 exclamation point and now let's click logged in and we should see successfully logged in logged out through this alert so uh, when we click ok we are at this point going to be logged in However, because we're just using a hard-coded variable inside our app component, we're not going to see any changes reflected. And that's something that we'll take a look at shortly, right? We're going to need to actually have Firebase listen for changes in the user's auth state. But anyway, those are the basics of logging in with Firebase auth. As you can see, it's super easy. It's literally just one function call that takes care of most of that for you. I hope this has been informative, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.